a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars, Coruscant Nights, Volume 2, Streets of Shadows, by Michael Reeves, 2008, read by Christopher Hurt, restored and remastered by The Archivist Publishing. And now, the unabridged edition of the story. Thirteen. The Plautical Market was probably not the biggest on Imperial Center, but then it was hard to say for certain, since no one had ever measured its full extent. Furthermore, its physical boundaries and the density of merchants to whom it was home were constantly shifting. Those who did their business there, and often lived there as well, were reluctant to extend much cooperation to the authorities. If they could be censused, they could be taxed. It was said of Plautical that you could find anything in the galaxy within its hive-like depths, legal, illegal, unimaginable. It was all there for those who knew how to work the innumerable streets and multiple levels. A large number of shops were not even listed on the electronic registries. You had to find them the old-fashioned way, by walking and asking directions. Word moved almost as fast by mouth on the streets and avenues of Plautical as it did via holocaust. Intel would reach the sector police of an establishment engaged in especially antisocial dealings, and by the time the cools had arrived at the indicated location, the entire business would have pulled up stakes and vanished, only to reappear somewhere else, kilometers away and levels up or down, under a completely different name and appearance. It was a game with hundreds, thousands of continually moving pieces, like a stadium full of Dejaric masters all playing on one another's games simultaneously. It was, in other words, a place that Dendur considered nothing less than designer hell. The street was narrow and crowded with merchant booths, hawking everything from strips of roasted hawk bat to risque hollows, and made even more crowded by the heterogeneous assortment of sentience appraising these wares. The cacophony of shouts, squawks, hisses, moans, stridulations, and other means of communication made Den fearful of getting an ear bleed. Add to that the heady, humid reek of open-air cooking, from Gungan Bouillabaisse to Wookiee Luau, spices, death sticks, stim sticks, other mind-altering vectors, and as always the staggeringly multiphasic stench of unwashed bodies, and the result was a full-out synesthetic assault. It made his time on Drongar seem pale by comparison. As he walked level H-26, Den studied the readout on the compact multitasking assistant, or MTA, that he carried. It contained a list of all the components Jax required in order to put together a rudimentary lightsaber. They were the absolute minimum items necessary to construct the elegant and deadly instrument that identified a Jedi. A second list accommodated those components that would make the final construct not just functional, but also worthy of its owner. The cheap pack that jounced against his back was half full. Certain parts were innocuous enough, focusing lenses and an emitter, a superconductor and a power cell, and therefore comparatively easy to obtain. Despite Platical's resources, other components were proving either more difficult or prohibitively expensive. Slowly, methodically, the latter constraint was yielding to the reporter's contacts or negotiating ability. Even so, Den realized glumly, without the CEC, the rest of the components were pretty much useless. Hey, watch it, Floob! The massive male Herglick, who had nearly stepped on Den, hastened to shift to one side. With a contrite, Howm! he gestured his apology. He could easily have crushed the irritated Celestin with one step, but Herglick tended as a species to be embarrassed by their size which was why Dan had felt secure in being rude, 
Had the near collision been with the pair of supple Cantrosians following immediately behind the Herglick, he would have been less blunt. A quick swipe of one of their paws could have left him with a bad case of Cantrosian scratch fever. He sighed and looked at his MTA list again, electronically checking off several more items. Personally, he thought, I think we've done pretty good to have gotten all that we have, especially considering the limitations on time and funds. Between his efforts and the stuff Renan had assembled during his earlier quest, Jax should have enough now to at least get started. Den had to admit that, intolerable as the Elemen's company could often prove, the tusk-crowned humanoid knew his business. Moving from shop to shop, from contact to contact, he somehow managed to come up with part after part at prices they could afford. But the lightsaber's key component, the CEC, continued to elude him. I'm not done yet, he muttered. There were still a few places deep within the market center that he intended to try. Though it seemed impossible, the crowds actually grew denser as he worked his way ever deeper into the seething, frenetic complex. Typical of any such market, Den knew, but in one the size of Plautical, the constant crush could grow wearying, if not actually dangerous, especially for someone whose kind ranked at the lower end of the humanoid size scale. On the other hand, his comparatively diminutive height allowed him to squeeze into places that the representatives of bulkier species could not access. Unfortunately, none of these booths had anything even faintly resembling a CEC for sale. At last, he was ready to admit defeat. With what we've managed to acquire and with what he's already got, Jax can assemble a lightsaber, he thought, as he made his way toward the eastern borders of the great market. It just won't work. The Celestin's step was plodding as he neared a marketplace exit. He was worn out from being pushed around or ignored by larger, clumsier beings. Oh, well, if he makes it heavy enough, he can always throw it at people. Just as he was about to exit, however, a flash of something caught his eye. He turned and beheld a kiosk that sold, among many other illegal things, replicas of sector police badges. Den stopped and looked at them thoughtfully. He'd seen phony ID before, and he had to admit the quality of these was quite good. The rank, picture, and shield number seemed to float, crisp and clear, a few millimeters above the badge itself. The kiosk's owner, an old and roomy Toydarian, noticed his interest. Rummaging around beneath the counter, he brought forth another badge, the picture ID of which was a Celestin. With a grin, he held it up. Yay? Yeah, eh? Yeah. Perfect likeness, is it not? Only four credits, a bargain. It wasn't a perfect likeness, as Den could plainly see. The person in the hollow had thinner ears and lips. Also, his skin was somewhat lighter in tone. But he also knew that such subtle differences didn't matter to anyone except another Celestin. To most sentients, representatives from any species other than their own were all but impossible to tell apart. Abruptly, he reached for his pocketbook. He had an idea. The teeming surface of Imperial Center was dotted with innumerable buildings that had been designed primarily to impress. For example, what made the Orvum Stadium unique was not its capability to seat hundreds of thousands of patrons, but the fact that every single seat could be adjusted to accommodate the individual needs of hundreds of different species. Clustered together a short distance away, the Protorian Polygon consisted of five towering spires linked by a completely transparent glassine bubble that contained three gourmet restaurants and a tourist pedway. Its shape sustained by powerful tractor and presser fields, the Aquala Tower rose only a modest distance into the sky but it was composed entirely of water. Non-aquatic visitors could don underwater breathing gear at the top or bottom and swim through multiple levels of real sea life, while citizens from water-breathing worlds could relax and enjoy the scenery without being burdened by specialized hydro-respiratory equipment. The greatest companies in the galaxy constantly competed to create corporate headquarters that were the most spectacular, the most innovative, and the most recognizable on Imperial Center. Mobilo Machines' office complex consisted of half a dozen sky towers in constant slow motion. Demonstrating the proficiency of its product line, Kiskar Repulsor Lift's headquarters floated exactly five meters off the ground. 
anyone could walk underneath the enormous structure and marvel at the power and technology that kept it not only aloft, but also in the same exact position, day after day. Captain Typho stepped out of an air taxi on the fringe of a structural complex that was not as tall as certain cloud cutters, not as elaborate as most commercial centers, and not as eclectic as the majority of Coruscant's great entertainment venues. Notwithstanding a deliberate architectural modesty, the buildings that stretched out before him were in their way some of the most impressive on the planet, for they constituted the bureaucratic hives of the imperial government. For the headquarters of his civil service divisions, the emperor had chosen to adapt and modify an existing business complex. Ostensibly, this was done to save time and money. The actual purpose was to divert attention from the many interior modifications installed, some of which would have appalled the few long-established citizens' rights groups still extant under the new order. From the outside, the group of office structures retained their original, innocuous, unprepossessing appearance. Within, they had been customized out of all recognition. In addition to a highly secure and specialized prison designed to temporarily hold dangerous and politically sensitive detainees, there was a complete med center intended to provide the best available care to the imperial staff. Living quarters boasted varying degrees of opulence. The most modern and efficient communications facilities kept the new government in touch with its vast, far-flung member worlds, colonies, and allies. As with the imperial palace itself, there were redundant life support systems, capable of sustaining a habitable environment indefinitely. If necessary, the extensive compound could function without any contact with the outside world, which meant that, should the rest of Imperial Center fall into chaos and collapse, the Imperial offices would continue to function. As he entered, Typho was impressed, but not awed. The purpose that drove him, that had brought him here all the way from Naboo, was bigger than any building, more powerful than any threat, and exalted his spirits higher than the crown of any cloud cutter. Once inside, he slipped into a steady stream of visitors. While the flow was more or less orderly, representatives from a majority of the civilized worlds occasionally jostled and pushed for position. No one came to this place for leisure. Everyone was engaged in business of one form or another that required their personal, as opposed to holographic, presence. Typho understood this quite well. His own concern certainly warranted it. Revenge was not a matter best conducted from a distance. Though the complex was enormous, it was designed to allow visitors and employees to carry out their assignments or complete their work within a day. It had to be that efficient. It wouldn't do to have outworld supplicants camping out in corridors in the hope of resolving their problems sometime the following days or weeks. Typho was among the least likely to suffer such a theoretical delay. As an officer and bureaucrat himself back on Naboo, he understood the workings of government complexes. While this one was incomparably bigger than any counterpart on his homeworld, the guidelines by which it operated were similar. Despite the occasional setback or dead end, he had little serious difficulty filling out the required flimsy work and navigating the facility. His persistence eventually found him a modest room occupied by a dozen beings seated at workstations. Half of them were human, the rest comprised various species. The middle-aged bureaucrat he eventually found himself before checked his vital data and acknowledged their validity with a squeal of approval. Typho had encountered Janet in such positions before. Short and stocky, with rodent-like facial features, prominent teeth, and white hair and facial fur, they were not from a humanoid perspective the most attractive of bipeds, but they were hard workers, and particularly famed for their near-infallible memories. While the Emperor was well known for his humanocentric policies, he was smart enough to hire the right species for the job. And who better, Typho reflected as he took a seat across from the smallish creature, to serve in a sensitive bureaucratic position where recall of detail was essential. The Jennet's low voice was interrupted by a good deal of ancillary huffing and puffing, but his command of basic was all in all quite admirable. So you are called Typho, a captain of Royal Household Security from Naboo? Yes. I am Losh. I've seen pictures of your homeworld. Unsightly, water-ridden place. Typho nodded. Perhaps so, but for sheer global repulsiveness, little can compare to Garban. 
at this insult to the planet that gave rise to his species, the genet's whiskers twitched. He was much pleased and not a little surprised. You are familiar with genet society? With the basics, Typho conceded modestly. As a security officer, I have to know galactic protocol. It wouldn't do to greet someone from the Tau Sakar system, much less Garvin itself, with a flowery compliment. Indeed it would not. The bureaucrat was impressed. Visitors who knew and understood that the Genet traditionally greeted one another with insults were few and far between. It's clear you are who you say you are. Certainly your Viti check out clean. Caressing a whisker on the left side of his bright pink face, the official studied the information floating in the air before him. According to the records, this is not your first visit to Imperial Center. Again, Typho nodded. I have had the pleasure before, yes. I hardly need tell you there is much to see and do here. His sigh emerged as a series of short, soft squeaks. Though as a mid-level functionary, I am fortunate if my family and I can spend more than a week or two each year availing ourselves of such pleasures. What is your purpose here, Captain Typho? Affable and welcoming, though the interviewer was being. Typho didn't relax his guard for a minute. The genet was merely doing his job in the most efficacious manner possible. Put your guest at ease, set his mind at rest, and then probe for the information you really want. I'm no tourist, Typho told him straightforwardly. Whiskers jerked. I guessed as much. Coming to this place does not fit the profile of a sightseer. So again, what is it you want? Information. What else? With a casual wave, Losh indicated their surroundings. The Emperor did not cause this complex to be compiled to provide entertainment. This section deals with government travel. You are a government official, albeit of a minor planetary system. Let me guess. You seek particulars regarding the travel of someone from Naboo, someone who has used government funds to visit Imperial Center on non-governmental business. No, Typho told him. Ah, then you are tracking someone who has violated Naboo's security and has either fled here or come seeking to avoid arraignment. Not bad either. While the bureaucrat's second guess was much closer to the mark, the captain was still able to respond honestly. The genet's curiosity was piqued. Since this represented a break from the daily monotony, he engaged more than usual. Something out of the ordinary, then. Captain, much as I enjoy conversing with you, even though the sight of your ugly face makes me bilious, I still have a daily administrative quota to meet. How can I help you? Be concise. You can use those filthy scavengers' eyes of yours, Typho replied politely, to research the names of visitors to a certain world on a couple of specific dates. Travel details, Whiskers bobbed. Simple enough. Pink fingers hovered in the air, poised in front of the luminescent, insubstantial control images above the desk. Go on. Typho tried not show his nervousness as he provided the parameters. On the date in question, Senator Padme Amidala of Naboo suffered fatal injuries at a mining site on Mustafar. At the time, she was under the protection of a Jedi named Anakin Skywalker. This was where his inquiry could get tricky and dangerous. I need to know if the Jedi in question survived, and if so, his possible whereabouts. The Jennet's whiskers stiffened sharply as he dropped his hands away from the floating aura of instrumentation. The Jedi are all dead. The Emperor has cleared that particular infestation from the galaxy. It is a violation of Imperial law to seek any data on them. As a security officer, you of all people should know that, Captain. Typho had anticipated this reaction. The unexpected and apparently violent death of Senator Amidala, who was much beloved by her people, was a tragedy from which many on Naboo have not yet recovered. As the officer in charge of her personal security, I have a special interest in finalizing the events concerning her passing. Even though you are obviously an official who's failed his way upward into a position far too complicated for his feeble mind, I'm sure you can understand and sympathize with that. As an official who has to deal daily with intrusive idiots like yourself. I suppose that I can. Sympathizing, however, is not a component of my job description. I'll take information over sympathy any day, Typho assured him. As the officer hesitated, Typho tensed and did his best not to show it, knowing that the genet could terminate the visit at any moment and send his visitor packing. If that happened, 
Typho would have to start all over again elsewhere, in a different section with a different bureaucrat. An instant cross-referencing would reveal to a second interviewer that the captain had already been granted a previous session, which meant that he and his request would likely be dismissed out of hand. If he was lucky. If he wasn't. Inwardly, Typho shuddered. Although his concern was still about failing Padme, rather than saving his own hide. After a long moment, Losh's fingers began moving again through the instrumentation display floating before him. I'm not sure why I'm helping you. I'm not required to do so. Researching the travels of Jedi falls far outside my purview. You're doing it because you're a lonely, frustrated, obnoxious excuse for an administrator, Typho told him. The Jennet's pink head bobbed, the white hair streaming down his back, shifting slightly with the movement. Or perhaps I'm inspired to take a break from routine by the meaningless ravings of an obviously psychotic off-worlder. Typho repressed a smile. Could be. Typically, it took longer to input the request than to receive the desired information. Somewhat surprisingly, there is data in the files relevant to that which you seek, so that the galactic populace may know what end justly befalls common criminals. The detailed fate of each Jedi is noted. Have a look for yourself. With the sweep of a finger, the Jennet caused a duplicate of the readout he was scanning to appear before the anxious Typho. His gaze traveled at high speed down the list. Opposite each Jedi's name were the details of that individual's passing. Occasionally the words unverified, unknown, or even more rarely, possibly still extant, appeared. To be certain of his conclusions, he made himself read through the entire list, though not all the pertinent details, until he reached the name he sought. Interestingly, among those listed as extant and possibly on Imperial Center, was a name he had encountered recently, Jax Pavan. That was the Jedi the bounty hunter Aura Singh had been looking for. Well, that was Jax Pavan's problem. The captain's concerns lay elsewhere. He read the entry for Skywalker, Anakin. His heart pulsed as he noted that the Jedi in question had indeed perished on the volcanic world of Mustafar. Though he scanned carefully through every subsequent name, there was no mention of Padme. Despite his disappointment, he knew that was to be expected. The list recorded the passing of Jedi, not ordinary galactic citizens. Such details of Padme's death were widely available in the general media, especially on Naboo. He read through the listing again. There was no mention of what Skywalker had been doing on Mustafar at the time of his death, though Typho already knew that. He was supposed to have been guarding Padme. More surprisingly, there was no description of his manner of passing, merely that he had met his end on that fiery, inhospitable world. Typho thought furiously. Skywalker had not been just any Jedi. He had been one of the best, personally driven to protect his ward, and exceptionally skilled in the use of the Force. Try as he might, Typho could not imagine who else on Mustafar at the time could have killed Padme in the strange fashion consistent with the official autopsy. Suppose Skywalker had indeed killed Padme, but had somehow subsequently made his escape. But then why would the official report show him as dead? Regardless of whether or not the Jedi had slain Padme, the Emperor wanted all Jedi dead. No one in officialdom would protect him, if anything, knowing that he had killed Padme would have made him a perfect example of a traitor for the Empire to hold up. Assume the opposite, then. Take the official record at face value. Anakin Skywalker was dead. Though his manner of passing was not described, Mustafar, after all, was a place where fiery death awaited at every step. If the Jedi had perished as a consequence of falling into boiling lava or being buried by an eruption, why wouldn't the record show that? The omission implied that he had died by other means. By other hands, Typho wondered. He had seen for himself Skywalker's skills and mastery of the Force. If natural means were not responsible, and if they were, there was no reason the captain could think of why that should not be reported in the official record, then it suggested a person or persons might be to blame. That made sense. Whoever wanted Padme dead and had slain her by such ingenious means 
would understandably have to kill her bodyguard first. Was it possible an individual existed with the power to overcome a Jedi as powerful as Skywalker? The Emperor himself could have done so, Typho knew. But Padme's death had occurred before Palpatine had declared himself. And in any event, Typho couldn't conceive of any scenario in which her death would have been politically advantageous to Palpatine's ascension. Who else, then? Another Jedi, perhaps. But why would one Jedi want another dead? Not to mention a renowned, respected, and well-loved senator from Naboo, who possessed that kind of mastery of the Force and that kind of raw hatred. That was when it hit him. That was when it all came together in his mind. A Sith. Only one of the Dark Lords commanded enough skill with the Force to overcome a Jedi as strong as Anakin Skywalker. Only one of that malevolent brood could casually dispatch someone as good and pure as Padme. As to who might want her dead? Well, with her outspokenness on behalf of the Republic, the Senator had made plenty of enemies, both within the old Senate and without. Many who favored the transition to the Empire would have been delighted at her passing including the Sith. He needed to be sure, of course. At the moment, he was only speculating, but the more he thought about it, the more he compared possibilities and alternatives, the more it made sense. Now he needed a name, an individual, but he could hardly expect the mundane official seated across from him to have access to the movements of the Sith. Are you all right? Losh asked. Not that I care what happens to a miserable supplicant such as yourself. I'm fine. Just making sure I have the information I need, you useless lump of worm munch. The Janet's whiskers inclined forward. Even though you are here on official business, don't forget to indulge in the delights of the world, city. A beady red eye winked. The lower levels in particular offer certain pleasures not to be found on any other planet. Of course, being mated and with family, I wouldn't know anything about that. Of course not. Typho rose from the chair. Thank you for your time and assistance. I hope you drown tomorrow. And may yours be the bloated corpse that rises from beneath to lift me up. With a wave of his hand, the bureaucratic rodent wiped the floating, glowing information from the air between them. The consultation was at an end. No one bothered Typho as he wandered the halls. He passed through security scans without being challenged, having left his blaster and the lightsaber he'd taken from Singh in a secure locker before entering the complex. All those individuals and the swirl of beings around him were caught up in their own concerns, since the Imperial complex was not a place in which to waste precious time. Everyone who passed the captain from Naboo assumed he was engaged in important work of his own. Security did not question him. They were looking for those likely to cause a disturbance or intersections that were off-limits. Security droids stepped or rolled or floated around him, ignoring his presence as he ignored theirs. How could he find out if a Sith Lord had been on Mustafar at the time of Padme's death? If one had been present, it would explain a great deal. He paused long enough to enter an eating establishment. Like any machine, a body functioned better when properly fueled. So he ate and drank but the food could have been made of tree dust for all the impression it made on his taste buds. Where and how to begin? To another such a quest might well seem hopeless, but not to Typho. He was experienced and knowledgeable, as well as determined. And having already gained entrance to the Imperial Complex, it would be easier to do so next time. What he needed to do struck him during the last few bites of his meal. A Sith, capable of killing a Jedi as strong as Anakin Skywalker, would undoubtedly be one the Emperor would keep close to himself, to keep an eye on as much as to make use of him. It might well be possible to learn if any Sith were based at the Imperial Complex. Typho had heard it said that the Sith Order had for centuries been pared down to a total of one master and one apprentice, but he doubted the truth of that. It seemed a perilous way to keep the Order extant. It was far more likely that there were many of them. Far from depressing him, the idea was heartening. It meant that Padme's killer might be close at hand, lurking in a corridor or doing the Emperor's bidding somewhere in the complex around him. The notion stimulated his thoughts and strengthened his resolve. Tomorrow, he told himself, 
After a night's rest, he would return in search of information far more dangerous than that which he had sought today. It would not be easy. After all, no one in their right mind deliberately sought to make the acquaintance of a Sith. But Captain Typho was not in his right mind. He was in love. Part 2 Rites of Passage 14. There was a reason why the Karek was literally, and not just colloquially, called a dive in the Nemoidian tongue. To enter, one stepped through a portal off the street, and then dropped a full story down to a waiting pedway. Powerful repulsors positioned on either side of the drop slowed visitors one by one, holding them suspended until security equipment mounted overhead and on both sides could run a thorough check on each and every visitant. Those who passed were allowed to drift gently to the ground and enter the establishment. Those who failed, argued, or otherwise tried to make trouble were sent back up to the street. Weapons were permitted. In this region of under-level Coruscant, it was the unarmed pedestrian who was considered unconventional. The no-nonsense owners of the Karek had no problem whatsoever with customers packing multiple instruments of destruction. Patrons were welcome if they entered weighted down with everything up to and including a tactical nuke. Use a weapon in the establishment, however, and one would find oneself set upon by what was considered the toughest security team in the sector, comprising grizzled veterans of the Clone Wars who had seen and dealt with everything several times. Into the sordid den of thieves, killers, and other miscreants dived an especially toothsome-looking female humanoid of indeterminate age, flame-red hair, and snow-white skin. Ara Singh could easily have emphasized her entrance by executing a couple of forward flips or twists as she let herself be grabbed and slowed by the entryway's field. However, she saw no reason to exert herself to entertain the Carex dissolute clientele, so she just jumped from the street and waited patiently for the security team to examine her and lower her to the floor. The identification that had been provided for her acknowledged her as a private agent on Imperial business. It was not questioned. Not even the lightsaber, which for anyone not working for Vader would have been caused to summon a platoon of stormtroopers and inquisitors, raised so much as an eyebrow. Vader's authority was indeed all-pervasive. She paused as the bouncer, a Sakian, looked her up and down, performing one last manual matching check between her person and her hand-carried ident. The folded hundred-credit note on the underside of the card was adroitly slid up the bald humanoid's sleeve, and he gestured curtly for her to proceed. Although her outward expression did not change, Singh smiled to herself as she strode deeper into the labyrinth and warren of rooms. Even with imperial clearance, it was never a bad idea to get on the good side of the head bouncer. She allowed herself to be subsumed by the noise from half a dozen different live bands. A storm of lights, some fixed, some ambulatory, bathed the adjoining rooms in every possible color and combination thereof, including the infrared and the ultraviolet. Depending on one species, subjecting oneself to too much of one hue or the other could result in a serious burn or minor cancer. The owners assumed no responsibility for such developments. Anyone old enough, bold enough, and sold enough on the delights of the car wreck to chance entry did so at their own risk. She finally found an empty stool in a chamber called the Crimson Red Rum. Arms extended wide, the Amanin pub tender gazed up at her. Something to drink, hard case? The hypersonic bubble encasing the bar made conversation possible despite the two competing bands. Singh was quietly amused. What makes you think I'm a hard case, flathead? Don't I look soft and cuddly to you? The Amani's small red eyes, adapted to seeing in weak light, focused on her. There is nothing of either about you, humanoid. I have seen your kind in here many times before. You're perceptive, she told him. It was a male, she saw by his coloring. I'm just a pub tender, he replied. I don't want any trouble. Don't curl yourself into a ball just yet. I'm looking for information, not trouble. 
I'll have a maranzane gold on the rocks. The pub tender hesitated. Expensive. Singh flashed the expense chit that had been provided her. The Amani frowned. You pay with the chit. Cash is better. But you'll make an exception in my case. He took the card without further protest. What kind of rocks would you like? He gestured behind him at the curved floor-to-ceiling storage bins. We have everything from pure silicates to rare non-ferrous metals. Frozen water will suffice. She listened to the two bands that filled the red room with wall-to-wall -wall noise. Each comprising multiple species, they seemed to be competing with each other to see who could play not the best music, but the loudest. The Imani was back in less than a minute. She took a sip of the liquid that gurgled in the tall glass and smiled lazily. Good. Now, you spoke of cash. Reaching down to the pouch riding at her waist, she unsealed the top length, and let him have a good look, before she resealed the pouch. What was visible within caused the Amani's small eyes to grow almost as large as her own. You should not bring so many Imperial credits into a place like this, he admonished her. A mere humanoid such as yourself could get seriously hurt. Don't worry about me, she replied. Now, for liquid refreshment, I pay credit. For food, I pay credit. For information, I pay cash. The Imani was too short to lean over the bar. Instead, he pushed himself up on his long, dragging arms until his face was level with her own. What is it you wish to know? What data do you seek? I'm looking for someone. His name is Jax Pavan, though he may be known around here by another name. She held up a hollow base. It immediately expanded to provide a three-dimensional rotating portrait of the man in question. He is a Jedi, though not much of one. The Amani's thick lips curled downward into a rubbery frown. The Jedi are all slain, slain by minions of the Empire. He stared at her a little harder. Are you a minion of the Empire? I work for myself. Actually, I'm employed directly by Lord Vader. The bartender hesitated, stared, then broke out laughing. A hard case with a sense of humor. That's rare. Well, it's no matter of mine who you work for. Glad you appreciate the absurdity of it. She pocketed the hollow base and the image disappeared. Maybe he's not a Jedi. Maybe I was given wrong information. Personally, I don't care if he's the Grand Master or a local scrap recycler. I just need to find him. I wish I could help you, hard case. I have an excellent memory. I know. That's why your kind are often employed as trackers. She smiled enticingly. I appeal to your mercenary nature. I can't give you information I don't have. I'd slime myself if it would jog the memory you seek, but there's just nothing there. Raising a huge three-fingered hand, he pointed toward the next room, the green dystopia. If anything, the music reverberating from within it was even louder than in the crimson red room. You might try talking to my colleague Kalati in there. The things one does for money, freedom, and a dark lord of the Sith she told herself as she slid off the stool. Starting toward the next room, she found her way blocked by three patrons. Her first impression was that they had been engaged for some time in a contest to see who could become the most drunk while continuing to remain upright and marginally functional. Her second impression was that it was a three-way tie. Not as far as the inebriated trio was concerned, however. Obviously hammered enough to cheerfully contemplate miscegenation, they surrounded her. The Zabrak was the most aggressive. A lupine Shistavanin hung back at one angle, while a large, stocky Utai blocked the other direction. Singh sipped her drink and calmly continued toward the green room. The Zabrak shifted to interceptor. He was tall, muscular, and soused to his horns, as the saying had it. He smiled down at her, revealing impressive canines. 
Haven't seen you in here before, little snowflake. Haven't been in here before, if you'll excuse me. Reaching out, he put a powerful hand on her left shoulder. She glanced at it, turned slightly, and he let it slide off. I wouldn't do that again. Why? The grin grew wider. Don't you like my touch? Not particularly. I also don't like your appearance, your attitude, your breath, and particularly your body odor. You stink. She eyed the Zabrak's intoxicated companions. As a matter of fact, you all stink, but at least there's variety to your stench. The Shistavanan and Utai exchanged amused glances. You're a real hard case, the Utai said. Funny, that's what the pub tender said. Maybe I need to change my hairstyle. The Utai scowled. Maybe you should be more polite, he suggested. That's right, the Zabrak agreed. Be ashamed to see a pretty snowflake like you get hurt when all we want is some nice. He reached out and grabbed her shoulder again. Arasing felt abruptly, unutterably weary. She had no time for this. But, she reminded herself, keeping a low profile was paramount when on the hunt. She would give them one more chance. I told you not to do that, she told the Zabrak. Move it or lose it. The Zabrak leaned in close, his breath an alcoholic miasma. Give us a kiss. No one saw what happened next. They knew it happened because they could see the results. But it had taken place so fast that when questioned later, all anyone could recall was two blurs, one of flesh and one of light. One moment the Zabrak had been leaning in toward Singh. The next he was staggering backwards, staring at his left arm, which had been cut through at the elbow with surgical precision by a single sweep of her lightsaber. His hand spasmodically clutched her shoulder for a moment before falling to the floor. The Zabrak staggered backward until he collapsed on a divan, staring in shock at the cauterized stump of his upper arm. The other two were momentarily paralyzed as well, but the immobility of shock did not last long. Get her, shouted the Utai, as he and the heavy wolfman lunged forward. Vibroblades flashed, aiming to mutilate and maim. Moments later, the Shistavanan's head was staring at the variegated ceiling, having been separated from his body. The Utai still stood upright, looking bewildered. Then a hair-thin line of red, straight as a laser, materialized down the center of his body from head to crotch. An instant later, the body's two halves fell neatly in opposite directions. The Amanin pub tender spoke into a comm link. Clean up in Section 7B. There was not a lot of blood, the lightsaber having cauterized the massive wounds even as they had been inflicted. Having spilled not a drop of her drink in the course of the melee, Ara Singh calmly deactivated her weapon and turned to regard the wide-eyed Zabrak. I'd have... A large drink, if I were you, she suggested. The shock will wear off soon, and you'll want to be self-anesthetized by then, she paused, then added. But have it somewhere else. The Zabrak, clutching the stump of his left arm, stumbled backward and let the crowd, which had scarcely paused in their frenzied dancing to observe the altercation, swallow him up. Clipping her lightsaber to her belt, Singh turned, walked back to the bar, and placed several credit slips on the counter in front of the Amani. I don't have time to answer questions. Not from your security, nor from sector police. This should cover any awkwardness. A three-fingered hand made the money vanish as deftly as any magician. What awkwardness? She smiled thinly, turned, and headed for the room called the Green Dystopia. 15. The quarters they had taken on the 44th level, Quadrant Q1, had the virtue of anonymity, if little else. The mixed bag of species that inhabited the surrounding resiplexes provided excellent cover. The cul-de-sac was also sufficiently out of the way to allow Deja to come and go without notice. Once her nucleon dropped below the 40th level, the media minox who drew income from harassing the bereaved survivors of celebrity casualties, tended to lose interest. While waiting for her arrival, Jax was assembling the components that Renan and Dan had managed to acquire. 
On the surface, it seemed a pointless endeavor. The result might look like a lightsaber, but its lack of a CEC rendered it little more than a prop. Nevertheless, he was determined to persevere. When and if they managed to acquire an energy crystal, everything else would be complete and in readiness. Nearby Den was relaxing with a pry viewer. It was a visor and earphones melded into a single unit that wrapped around his head like a too large high-tech crown that had slipped down over his eyes. Occasionally he would let out a hoot of appreciation or a chuckle of laughter as whatever he was viewing tickled his fancy. Settled on the other side of the central work center, Loranth was cleaning one of her two blasters. The gray paladins did not carry their weapons for show. Nevertheless, they took pride in having clean and functional ordnance. In the far corner of the room, Renan was dozing, arms folded across his reedy chest. All the walking, talking, and endless negotiations he had engaged in on behalf of Jax had tired him out. He deserved a rest, he had told them, and he was of no mind to aid either the Jedi or the Paladin in their menial pursuits. Verbal, as opposed to manual dexterity, was his strength. He would save his energy and his efforts for more dignified pursuits. Thank you very much. I-5 stood nearby. He was outwardly immobile, but Jax knew that the droid's mind was humming away as it perused multiple matters simultaneously. It was something few organics were capable of, because most organic brains couldn't self-partition. Jax wondered what topics occupied the droid. By this time, he knew better than to ask. He had no desire to grant the metal man any more opportunities to flaunt his maximized self-awareness. The truth of the matter was, he was still getting used to the idea himself. The concept of a droid being fully conscious was something he had accepted only reluctantly. It still made him uncomfortable at times to muse upon the ramifications of a truly sentient machine. Before he'd met I-5, his feelings about a droid's place in organic society had been the same as everyone else's. Droids were tools, convenient ambulatory mechanisms to be used or discarded as necessity dictated. He would not have thought twice about ordering one to jump into a vat of acid or carving it up for parts, if doing so served his purpose on a mission. Droids were expendable and an infinitely renewable resource. If one became defective or was otherwise compromised in any way, it was simply recycled for parts, and a new one ordered at the temple's expense. There was never a shortage. To be the head of a production company such as Trang Robotics or Cybot Galactica was like having a license to print credits. While it was true that some sentients developed feelings of attachment, even affection for their droids, Master Obi-Wan, he recalled, had been adamant about his astromech accompanying him on missions during the Clone Wars. For the most part, People viewed the automatas the same way they might view a more sophisticated version of a bread crisper. Jack certainly hadn't had occasion to wonder about any inner lives they might have been hiding. That attitude had changed when he'd met I-5. He'd been forced to change his opinion not just about the droid, but also about I-5's partner, Lorne Pavan, the father he had never known. The droid had told him much about his father's life but had been maddeningly vague about the specifics of his death. All Jax had been able to glean was that his father's fate had been ordained by someone highly echeloned in the Republic, someone who might even have had access to Palpatine himself, back when he had been Supreme Chancellor. I-5 would be no more specific than that, and Jax couldn't tell if the droid knew nothing more, or wouldn't say anything more, or both. He suspected the last possibility, however. Whatever his father had done must have reverberated considerably through the halls of power back in the waning years of the Republic for the droid to be so close-mouthed about it more than two decades later. He had hinted darkly that Lorne and himself, along with a Jedi Padawan named Darsha Asant, had been pursued by an all-but-unstoppable assassin whose sole purpose had been to retrieve a hollow cube that Lorne had attempted to fence on the black market. Both the Padawan and his father had died and I-5 had escaped only by luck. Jax paused in his work, thinking. He'd attempted to learn more about his father's mysterious end on his own, but he was at best a journeyman slicer, and digging for data that old required far more skill than he possessed. Come to think of it, though, someone with the requisite skill 
was no farther than the other side of the room. As if telepathically alerted, Renan bestirred himself long enough to check his chrono. Your lady friend is late. Pushing the magnifier up on his forehead, Jax replied, She's not my lady friend. And I'm sure she has a good reason for being late. At any rate, it's not our business. She's a Zeltron. They're not known for dependability. The element closed his eyes again. The exchange had been loud enough to draw Den's interest. The Celestin lifted the pry viewer up over his head and set it aside. It should be at least partly our business, Jax, he said. Pulling from his pocket a finger-sized unitary, he unfolded its screen with a flick of his wrist. You want to know why? Take a look at our credit balance. I doubt that organic vision is capable of resolving so tiny a figure, I-5 said. Jax gave him a look of displeasure, then turned back to the Celestin. How bad is it, Den? Well, it's not a crisis. We have enough in the account to eat tomorrow. The day after that... I see no problem, then. For me, the droid said. We'll have to move, too, Dan added. I see. Pulling off the magnifier, Jack set it on the work center. What will we be able to afford? The Celestin studied the readout on the unitary. I think there's a public park over in Sector 19. I didn't realize it was that bad. It's not. Dan assured him as he collapsed the screen and pocketed the unitary. It's worse. Why didn't someone tell me before? Someone tried, Den told him. Several times. You kept telling me or Renan that the Force would provide. Well, now would be a good time to crank it up. We could sell the Far Ranger, Laurent suggested. Both Dan and Renan glared at her. No way, the Celestin said. That ship's our only chance to get off this rock which I'm still hoping will happen once you two idealists decide to get practical, because if you don't, we may wind up living in it. If I may be allowed to venture a suggestion, I-5 said. Since when have you ever asked permission? Laurent put aside the blaster she had been working on and started on its mate. Dijadware, the droid continued, is the sole beneficiary of a well-known, well-respected, and most importantly, well-recompensed deceased artist. His photoreceptors focused on Jax. I see no reason why, if prior to her departure, she still wishes us to continue our efforts to locate Follette's killer, that we should not be paid for them. Hear, hear, Laurent murmured while checking the emitter of her second blaster. A capital suggestion, in both senses of the word, added Renan. Works for me, Den said. Jax was horrified. I can't do that. As a Jedi, I am sworn to help those in need, and to assist those who request my aid. I can't charge for it. Especially not someone in a disturbed emotional state. It's not ethical. He spread his arms. In fact, it's one step short of bounty hunting. I'd feel like a mercenary again. I swore I'd never again sink that low. Dan had to kick out with both legs to get off the couch, which had been designed to accommodate much taller species. Approaching Jax, he waved a stubby finger at the reluctant Jedi. You do the work, and let the rest of us worry about the metaphysical fallout. Evidently, Jax's conflict was plain to see, because Den added, not unkindly, It's not that we're asking you to go against any deeply felt personal beliefs, Jax. Yes, it is, I-5 said without hesitation. Den glared at his mechanical friend. It's only that, he continued to Jax, no matter how noble your intentions or how worthy what we're currently doing, there are mundane and uninspiring matters that simply can't be ignored, like the rent. And food, Laurent added. Minimal appearances must be maintained, put in Renan. All right, all right. Jax took a deep breath and checked his chrono. When she gets here, I'll talk to her. He let his gaze rove around the room. If this only involved me, I'd continue to say no, but we're all in this together. So in this one instance, I'll allow myself to be outvoted. Never underestimate the humanoid affinity for rationalization, I-5 said. The reporter turned to the others. We should each find something else to do when Deja arrives. He spoke to all of them, but he was looking at Laurent. The Twi'lek hesitated, glanced at her unfinished work on the bench, 
than at Jack's. The Jedi was puzzled by that look, which seemed compounded of equal parts amusement and annoyance. She said nothing, however. She merely gathered up the disassembled pieces of her blaster. The main domicile entryway chose that moment to announce the arrival of a visitor. Its integrated evaluator declared the caller to be unaccompanied, unarmed, and, insofar as could be determined from outward appearances, not a representative of the police or any other branch of unwelcome officialdom. We'll let ourselves out through the secondary exit, Den informed Jax as he headed for the far side of the communal room. Renan followed close behind, together with I-5. Loranth was the last to leave. She lingered a moment. Secure an agreement and fix a suitable retainer, she told Jax. Take your time, but not too much time. He frowned uncertainly. I don't follow your meaning. Loranth gave him another bland look, which still seemed somehow annoyed. What I mean is, we don't have time to waste. We have plenty of time. The whiplash hasn't even scheduled Deej's departure yet. They still have to secure passage and... My mistake. She turned fast enough to send her leku whirling and strode out head high. What in the world has gotten into her? The Jedi wondered. He had little time to ponder it, however, because a twitch of the Force's strands reminded him that Deej was at the door. When he let her in, she didn't look around. By now she was familiar with the surroundings. I'm sorry to ask you to meet us here, but it's my experience that dwelling in borderline squalor is good for security. I'd rather be safe than comfortable. She waved off his apology. Where's everyone else? Even your impertinent droid is gone, and he's usually no more than a meter from your side. Would you rather wait for them to return? No, that's not necessary. She smiled, which made him feel slightly uncomfortable. I'm sure you can fill me in on whatever I need to know. Jax felt momentarily at a loss, then drew himself up. This was ridiculous. Master Peel would have considered being alone with a Zeltron of the opposite gender nothing more than a test. After all, he had the force to counteract her pheromones. It didn't seem to be helping all that much, however. I need to go over some pre-departure details with you he explained. Things you need to do before you wrap up your final affairs, ways to go about them so as not to arouse suspicion, how to terminate any close relationships, that sort of thing. Travel information. Good. He hesitated again. Uh, you might want to take notes. Not necessary. I have a good memory. She sat, hugging her knees to her chest and giving him her undivided attention. As he began to recite some of the procedures that would be necessary for her to ensure a safe and anonymous departure from Coruscant, he couldn't help but be aware of the body stocking that covered her like a second loosened skin. He used the force to deflect the pheromones he could feel pulsing from her, but the visual alone was enough to keep him stumbling over his tongue like an anxious Padawan. Deja pretended to notice nothing unusual in his behavior, of course, she simply sat, curled up in a supple tangle of arms and legs, and listened attentively. With her empathic talents, however, there was no question but that she was acutely aware of his inner turmoil. As he strode back and forth in front of her, taking care to keep a certain nominal distance, he was positive that he could feel her inner glow of satisfaction, hot as an undamped reactor core. Eventually, he ran out of things to say to her, except of course, for the one thing he'd been dreading saying since she walked in the door. Despite having reached an agreement with his companions, now that the time had come to propound it, his Jedi training continued to resist. She stared at him. Was there something else, Jax? No. Yes. Girding himself in every respect, he sat down beside her. Deja, I don't want to do this. I've been trying to think of the best way to ask it of you, the least offensive way, to make this request. Her eyelids fluttered, and her crimson skin was positively aflame. I'm Zeltron, Jax. Whatever request you want to make, I'm sure I've heard it before. Good. That makes it easier. He broke off in shock at what the Force showed him behind those eyes. She'd chosen to reveal her thoughts 
Of that he was sure. No one with her psychic sensibilities could be read so easily. He stood hastily. That's, uh, that's not what I mean. At all. Her expression turned uncertain. I don't understand. Then what kind of request are you having trouble making? What I'm trying to say, Deja, is that we're about out of funds, and if we're going to continue to help you, I'm going to have to ask for a retainer. There, he'd managed to get it out. Though the request still sounded obscene to him, he looked away. I should have let Den do this, he told himself unhappily. Or Renan, or even I-5. Asking for money wouldn't have bothered any of them in the least. He felt ashamed to look at her, reluctant to use the force to sense her feelings. How would she react? Would she be hurt, insulted, angry? He forced himself to turn and face her, and saw that her right hand was unsealing her jeweled carry bag. How much do you need? Do you want cash or a credit transfer? Relief left him momentarily weak in the knees. She was watching him with a coy smile that seemed to say, There now. That was easy enough, wasn't it? Less than an hour after he'd brought her up to date and she'd left, his colleagues rejoined him. How'd it go? Den inquired anxiously. Did she balk at the request? Yes, Renan wanted to know. Do we eat well tonight? I-5 made a snorting sound with his vocabulator. It's always about food with you organics. Jax, affecting an air of complete and utter confidence, said, I am happy to say that thanks to the gracious and understanding Dija Duare, we now have an open line of credit through the planetary banking system under two new assumed identities, either of which any of you can now freely access. Renan's tusks quivered in gustatory anticipation. I thank you, Jax. There is nothing worse than being a gourmet in a world of indiscriminate eaters. Except having to listen to one, Den said. But seriously, Jax, good work. Yes, I-5 agreed. It would have been enough to have secured a promise of token payment, but an unlimited line of credit. Your efforts exceed my expectations. I may go so far as to indulge in a logic board tune-up. Basking in their praise, Jax noticed that compliments were lacking from one of the group. Having once again taken her seat at the work center, Laurent had resumed her equipment upgrading without a word. He shrugged. He thought briefly about probing her feelings with the Force, but decided to respect her privacy. If the Paladin had a problem with him, his past experience with her guaranteed that she wouldn't be reticent to let people know when she was ready. Still, it did somewhat dampen the celebratory mood. Sixteen. I'm looking for the Kragmaloid Boulad. I was told you might know where I could find him. The green Nikto sitting in the ticket kiosk of the sleazy hollow booth looked Typho deliberately up and down. Who told you that? Does it matter? Courteous and diplomatic most of the time, Typho could be tough when the occasion demanded. Here in the bowels of Coruscant, occasion did more than demand. It positively screamed. Can you help me or not? Depends. The Nikto groomed his facial scales with his long claws. Can you pay? I didn't take you for a philanthropist. Typho unsealed a pocket and brought out a fistful of credit chits. Avarice replaced some of the disinterest in the Nikto's large obsidian eyes. He licked his narrow lips. How'd I know you're not the police? Get serious. Do you really think a dreg like you is worth the sector's time? The Nikto cackled, halting only when his laughter degenerated into a hacking cough. Typho made sure to stay well out of respiratory range while waiting for the attack to finish. A clawed right hand, swept the credits from the captain's grasp. Twenty-third level, the Nikto said. Quadrant D-3, Sector 212. You didn't hear it from me. Hear what? Typho turned and walked away. Nighttime, down level on Coruscant, wasn't all that different from daytime. In the abyssal ferrocrete depths, the sunlight hardly ever penetrated to any perceptible degree, 
The light came from fluorescence, electroluminescence, and other sources. Even so, the combination rarely amounted to more than a perpetual twilight. Down here, life surged and pulsed to rhythms unsettling to the average citizen. It was best, Typho had found, to move at a brisk clip to project a don't-mess-with-me attitude. Uncertainty more than anything else drew the attention of predators and scavengers. The entrance to the address Typho had been given was on the bottom row of what appeared to be a run-down resiplex, even though he couldn't see them. He knew his body was being scanned by a plethora of security devices. If he could see them, he reflected, they wouldn't be very secure. You're armed, a voice accused from a hidden speaker. Of course I'm armed. What kind of idiot would come to a place like this without being armed? He hoped the scan had only registered his blaster. The lightsaber was secured in the inside lining of his jacket, along with a small confounder that was supposed to render it invisible to detection. The exact extent of your idiocy has yet to be determined. There was a click, and double doors parted. They were much higher and wider, Typho noted as he entered, than was necessary to accommodate the passage of the largest humanoids on Coruscant. The female Kragmaloid who met him displayed no weapons. Given her impressive size and bulk, none were needed. Check your lethal devices, please. Certainly. Typho had no compunction about handing over his blaster and vibro knife. Not in light of the fact that the female asking for them stood more than three meters tall, massed over two hundred kilos, and could kill him with a blow of one massive fist. It was strange, however, to be frisked by a trunk as well as by hands. Despite their immense size, they traveled over his person with surprising delicacy. Satisfied that she had relieved the visitor of every instrument of destruction, regardless of size, she stepped back. Follow me. The chamber where she left him was occupied by one other. It spoke to Bulad's confidence that he would meet alone with a complete stranger. Of course, help was likely only a trumpet away. And while it was one thing to talk oneself into the fixer's presence, it would be rather more difficult to get out in the event that things did not proceed as intended. The fact that the average adult Kragmaloid had the strength of half a dozen large humanoids was threat enough. Bulad's kind were known for their directness. Typho's host did not disappoint in that regard. The fact that you found your way here means that you seek something you cannot find anyplace else. Typho could feel the deep, sonorous voice vibrate the floor beneath him, heard it echo off the cavernous walls. The entire block of resicubes, he realized, had to be a facade, a hollowed-out shell that formed the Kragmaloid's lair. This chamber was dimly lit, sparsely furnished, and big enough to house a sky lorry. It also smelled faintly like hay. He responded to Bulad's statement. Your perception flatters you. This produced a deep grunt that might have indicated satisfaction, recognition, or perhaps indigestion. Unfamiliar as he was with Craigie punctuation, Typho chose to accept it as encouraging. He gestured behind him. Your mate? A niece, perhaps? Attractive as well as competent. The Kragmaloid's tiny eyes opened wider. Typho had chosen his opening well. He knew that the pachydermoids would rather discuss clan or relationships than just about anything else, so they spent the next twenty minutes talking family, with the captain letting his host carry most of the conversation. By the time Bulad had finished waxing rhapsodic about his current wife, Typho had been accepted as an honest broker, if not quite a member of the family. For one of the feeble trunkless, you are a pleasant exception, Bulad told him. Still, it is time that you stated your business. Just so, Typho agreed. I seek the disposition of any Sith on a certain world at a specific time. Even for the representative of a species that valued honesty and directness above all, Bulad was taken aback, his trunk elevated in surprise. Why not ask me something easy to obtain? like the Emperor's personal taste in beverages, or the home of the current mistress of the Senate Vice President. Typho proceeded to fill in his host on the necessary details. 
when Boulard had recorded them all on an appliance designed to accommodate his massive digits. He grunted anew. All this is a simple matter to research, except for all of it. You understand, Typho said, why I couldn't walk into Imperial Records and ask for a hard copy. Boulard's trunk waved affirmation. By now there would be little of you left to question. The Emperor does not like anyone prying into such interdicted material, even for something as simple and innocent as travel itineraries. How resourceful of you to find it all by yourself, without any assistance from anyone, especially anyone like me. The captain smiled. I amaze myself sometimes. And now to the matter of money which cannot be avoided. For such a dangerous service, at risk of inviting potentially lethal attention, I must charge 5,000 credits. If you cannot pay such an amount, then you may utilize the exit, for our business here is done. I respect your manner, but I will not take such a risk for anything less. And if you know the people of Ancus, you know that we do not bargain in such things. Our word is our bond. Typho was not a man of unlimited means by any stretch of the imagination. But he had determined from the beginning of his quest that money could and would be no object. Very well, he said, pulling out his coin purse. I assume cash is acceptable. Mandatory. Boulard leaned forward, towering over his guest. My people have already secured the information you want at least as much as was available. Typho blinked in surprise as he paid his host. That was fast. I was curious to know the why and wherefore of what you sought. If you were able to pay for it, so much the better. If not, it was worth researching to see if it might prove valuable to someone else. A flicker of fear shot through the captain. If the Sith or any of their minions learned that someone was delving into their travel records? Without thinking, he said as much to Boulard. His host was no Janet, for whom Typho's uncertainty would have been a compliment. You wound me, visitor. I am an honest broker, as are all in my family. He gestured to his left, from where another somewhat smaller Kragmaloid was joining them, including my third son, Arlumek whom I believe has brought the information you requested, and have now paid for in full. While the elder Kragmaloid counted and pocketed his payment, Arlumek placed a small emitter in front of the expectant Typho. Heavy hands manipulated instrumentation, and words appeared in the air between them. They obviously meant nothing to the younger Kragmaloid, who turned away in disinterest. To Typho, however, they meant a great deal. The strictly prohibited records that the Slicer's family had somehow managed to access indicated that one Darth Sidious had journeyed to Mustafar, was there at the same time as Padme and Anakin Skywalker, and had returned shortly thereafter. His mind whirling, Typho excused himself. Now that their mutual business had been concluded, however, Bulad was reluctant to see the human go. Stay he entreated his visitor. I would hear more of your excellent family. Sorry, Typho headed toward the door. I have pressing business to attend to. A pity, the jovial Kragmaloid called after him. If you ever have something similar to trade, you know where to find me. Typho spent the rest of the night wandering the underlevels, his thoughts churning. Twice he was approached by footpads, but a glance at his face was enough to convince them that easier pickings lay elsewhere than on the corpus of the half-crazed human. Padme, Padme, he whispered to himself. Retribution is at hand. Retribution and justice. I know now who killed you. Like any puzzle, it was simple to solve once you had all the pieces. Who could have penetrated her security on Mustafar? Who could have slain the senator's resourceful, determined bodyguard and suffered dearly in the fight that would surely have followed any attempt to harm her? 
Anakin Skywalker would not have gone down easily. Yes, the answer was clear now. Darth Vader had killed them both. Therefore, Vader must die. He wasn't worried about getting close enough to the Dark Lord to finish him, even though he knew that one as adept in the Force as Vader surely would detect any threat. Typho knew from his own work as a specialist in security, that given sufficient knowledge, determination, and ability, coupled with the disregard for his own life, an assassin could get to any public figure. A soldier such as himself had both of those assets. Early in his quest, he had realized that to avenge Padme, it was reasonable to assume he would have to sacrifice his own life, and he was fully prepared to do so. The problem lay in getting physically close enough to Vader to strike. What would draw Vader away from the security that undoubtedly surrounded him? What might induce the Dark Lord to forego his usual caution and meet alone with an unfamiliar intermediary? As aid to the Emperor, Vader needed nothing. That didn't mean he was devoid of desire, of course. But what could such an incarnation of evil want? Abruptly, he remembered what the bounty hunter, Aura Singh, had said during their confrontation in the ruins of the Jedi Temple. On behalf of Lord Vader, I was hoping to find evidence here of a Jedi named Jax Pavan. Vader was looking for a surviving Jedi named Pavan and Typho recalled seeing the name Jax Pavan listed on the Imperial Administration Complex readout as being possibly still alive. So the Dark Lord wanted this particular surviving Jedi badly enough to send a bounty hunter as celebrated as the relentless Aura Singh after him. She had been searching for him locally, in the ruins of the Jedi Temple, which meant that, unless the bounty hunter was way off the mark, not likely, given her reputation, Jax Pavan was somewhere on Coruscant. Not only on Coruscant, but somewhere nearby. That was it. That was the solution. Jax Pavan would serve as the bait to bring Darth Vader within killing range. How precisely Typho was going to carry out the assassination was something he still had to plan, but he had no doubt a means could be managed. Having spent his entire professional life learning how to keep people from being killed, had taught him how best they could be slain. No question about it. Darth Vader was going to die. Padme Amidala would be avenged. And so would Anakin Skywalker. But before he could begin to put the final plan in motion, there was one more thing he had to do. He had to find Jax Pavan. Seventeen. It seemed to Jax that no matter how hard they worked, they couldn't get a break. It wasn't as if no one on the streets had heard of Ves Volette, ever since the devastation that had been wrought on his homeworld. Every prominent Kamasi on Imperial Center had been fodder for media interviews, commentary, and a good deal of tisk-tisk gossip. The violent death of one as famous as Volette made his name even more widespread. But this was Imperial Center, the world city, home to billions upon billions, and workplace to billions more. Here the murder of an artist, no matter how well-known, was minor news at best. If not for the Kamasi connection, it would have required a dedicated search by those with a particular interest in such matters to determine that it had even occurred. Jackson and his friends had performed such a search, and come up devoid of clues. Ideas they had in plenty. The trouble was none of them were panning out. The Jedi's only consolation was that the sector police were no nearer solving the crime than he was. Of course, had Prefect Paul House made it a priority and devoted all his resources to its resolution, his department doubtless would have made better progress. But the Prefect's bailiwick included dozens of levels, thousands of buildings, and more species than Jax could name. The murders alone, considered apart from all other violent crimes, were backlogged by years. At least, Jax thought, there are five of us to focus on a single crime. That was encouraging. Just not very much. Deprived of the resources of a modern police department, all they had to go on were the answers to the several questions they had deployed among contacts, who, with luck, were in the know. Thus far, these had proved erroneous, futile, or leads to dead ends. Jax dreaded every communication with the disheartened Dijadwari, 
because each time he was forced to report the same lack of progress. They were getting nowhere, and his feeling of guilt only increased every time he deposited the Zeltron's money into their communal account. They were bound to eventually learn something worthwhile, he told himself, if only through the virtue of sheer persistence. For the most part, his colleagues went about their assignments with minimum complaints, but without an overabundance of enthusiasm. He was in particular concerned about Loranth, who seemed to be growing more and more withdrawn. The Twi'lek had always been moody, but even Renan, who wasn't exactly a draft of fresh oxy at his best, had had occasion to remark on her state. She had over the last few days taken to tucking her leku stump behind its mate instead of letting it hang freely as she used to. That meant something, Jax was sure. He just didn't know what. Also, he noticed that when she spoke to him, it was always in brief, curt syllables, never stating or asking more than was absolutely necessary. Dan carried out his tasks with crisp efficiency, but without noticeable enthusiasm. And instead of assisting his companions, I-5 had taken to spending periods of time uplinked to a hollow-knit grid, at considerable expense. When Jax had asked his purpose, the droid had replied, You're not getting many results with your tactics, so I thought I'd try some things on my own, at a more reasonable data speed rate. Frankly, watching you organics laboriously process information is like watching supercooled hydrogen flow. Anything worthwhile to report? Not yet. There came at last a day when it seemed that their luck might change. Aboard, Renan received a communication from a local police outpost, which he duly relayed to Jax. Excellent, the Jedi said. Something from House's people at last. He searched the Elemen's dour face. What is it? Have they finally picked up a viable suspect? Did someone actually confess? Or is it a good lead they feel free to share with us? None of those. Renan handed Jax a copy. Read it if you wish. I'll spare you the details. The gist is that one of us needs to go to Sector Police Subpost 186 to bail out a certain Celestin named Dendur. Unless, and this is the course of action I personally recommend, you would rather he remain in custody. Loranth was at the work center repairing a comm unit. She didn't speak or look up. Even Den's longtime companion I-5 did not break whatever silent cybernetic conversation he was involved in to voice his opinion. Jax put the hard copy aside. No point in reading it. The meticulous former bureaucrat would, as he said, already have read and analyzed every aspect of the official document, if only to alleviate his boredom. What charge are they holding him on? Impersonating a police officer. But not to worry, I'm sure a word or two from your close personal friend, the Prefect, will see him back on the street within minutes. I suppose we can't do anything via comm channels? Nope. If it's to be done at all, his release must be realized in person. I nominate you. Jax gave him a look of annoyance, an effort that was wasted, since the element had already turned away. The Jedi turned to I-5. You want to come with me? There might be details I'll need to quick check. But the droid, lost in the maze of cybernetic data processing, did not respond. Jax shrugged. Guess I'll go by myself. As he started for the door, Laurent looked at him. Come back to us, she said to him. Encouraged by her tone, he paused and looked back. Are you saying you'd miss me if I didn't? No, she replied, utterly deadpan. I'm saying that we don't have sufficient funds to bail out two of you, and I don't want to have to decide which of you goes free. Ennui had its uses, Jax decided, as he and Dan exited the heavily armored, windowless front of the police subpost. It was a state of being that crossed species lines. It was as good a reason as any why the cools had walked, or in one case slimed, through the necessary interviews and the hectares of flimsy work, that had eventually allowed the Jedi to extricate the Celestin from custody. The bail that had been required to accomplish Den's release was as good as forfeited, he knew, since Den had no intention of reporting for trial on the date set. What were you thinking? he asked as they made their way down the level 14 street, heading for the nearest public transport. I was looking for a way to get some information out of a certain Vernal, 
a real Mopac head named Shul Fa. He's a merchant over in, we've spoken with dozens of merchants, all to no avail. Ah, but not in the capacity of an investigating police officer. Jax looked at him. Tell me you learned something. Shul Fa's an art dealer. Some of Jax's enthusiasm faded. Let me guess, he owns some of Ves Vallette's sculptures. Two pieces, to be precise, Den elaborated. They're still in one of his several galleries because the artist's price has gone way, way up since his death. And each time it goes up, Shulfa raises his asking price. It's a fairly straightforward piece of commercial brinkmanship. He keeps hoping that one day a buyer will pay at the top of the asking bid. But that's not what I found especially interesting. He told you something he didn't tell the police? He told me something, in my transitory guise as a police representative, that he hasn't had a chance to tell House and his goons, because they hadn't asked him yet. It seems that the two Vallette light sculptures Shulfa acquired didn't come to him through normal, that is to say, legal channels. They were stolen. Den was enjoying his moment of triumph. Less than a year ago. Jax said slowly, Deja never said anything about that? The Celestin pointed out. We didn't ask her. Anyway, so I pressed Shulfa, threatened to take him in for attempting to vend stolen goods, and he offered me a bribe to keep quiet about the whole matter. I told him that I would, but that he could keep his money in return for the name of the individual who provided him with the goods. Which is? Spa Fon a Nuknog fence and extortionist. Jax thought about it. Even shorter than Celestans, the typical Nuknog would barely come up to the Jedi's waist. As a species, they defined the concept of looking out for number one. Nuknogs stuck their necks out for no one. Since their necks were longer than their legs, this was probably a good idea. They were cunning, greedy, and totally amoral as well as being deft manipulators with sharp eyesight and keen hearing. Such a being would make a superior thief, provided he didn't have to run too fast. Jax could certainly envision one stalking and ultimately burglarizing an artistic member of a trusting species such as the Kamasi. It gets better, Den continued. Fawn's local. Jax grinned at the Celestin. I take back everything I've said about you, Dan. What have you been saying about me? Never mind. I'm sure it can't be any worse than what I-5 says about me. I even take back everything he says about you. Thanks to your imaginative stunt, we've got more than a clue. We have a suspect. What's the address? Dan rolled off a street name and number. Jax overlaid the information on a mental picture of the immediate region of Coruscant. He was not surprised to find that the address was nearby. Most thieves dwell in close proximity to their victims. It simplifies transportation. Let's go have a little chat with this spa fawn. 18. The address the Batrachian art broker had reluctantly revealed to Dan was, surprisingly, located on the 42nd level in a neighborhood that could at least lay claim to potential gentrification, which was to say that one was marginally less likely to be mugged and robbed there on a dark night than on many of the innumerable levels below. Nevertheless, Jax and Dan did not relax as they exited the transport and made their way on foot to the complex, where, according to the information Dan had been given, the Nook and Og made his business as well as his home. This portion of level 42 was infused with photonics, so that wired or radiant lighting was not required. Shop fronts flaunted their goods without the usual security bars or alarm beams, and the guards out front actually wore uniforms instead of just harsh expressions and weapons. It wasn't the Manorai Hills, not by the length of a comet's tail, but it was considerably more upmarket than either of them had anticipated. Business must be good, Jax mused. The address given to Den was almost comically nondescript, so much so that it was impossible to tell whether they were looking at the front of a residence or a business. There were no windows, no other doors, not even any visible vid pickups, just a floor-to-roof rectangle of dull gray carbonite composite 
with a number floating half a centimeter to one side of the center. Jax knocked loudly. The response time was long enough to make him think that no one had heard. But as he raised his fist to pound again, a portal appeared in the center of the gray wall, revealing a lawn chair standing there. Barely half a meter tall, skinny and indigo in hue, it regarded them out of four bright turquoise eyes beneath a single tuft of pale blue hair that rose from the crest of its skull. Jax had never seen a lawn chair before. There weren't a lot of them in this part of the galaxy. Normally shy and species-centered, they tended to keep to themselves in three closely packed systems far out on the south arm. Like every other civilized species, they had representation on Imperial Center, but to see one in private service was unusual. Perhaps Spa Fawn, being of modest stature, preferred servants even less physically imposing than himself. Certainly the Longier's high squeaky voice was not exactly daunting. Ye gets after beadness with Spa Foon? Den stepped forward. We do? The lawn chair looked the Celestin up and down. You don't look desart, Jack said. Does the redoubtable Spafon judge business acumen by appearance? In quick, smooth succession, one after the other, four eyes blinked at the Jedi. I after be not in Nams. Jack supplied two making them up on the fly and hoping his companion would remember his. Den's previous profession had taught him to retain minutiae, so the Jedi wasn't too worried. The lawn chair instructed them to wait and disappeared into a hallway. It wasn't gone long. When he returned, he ushered them in with a gesture. As they entered, Den whispered to Jax, Don't you find it peculiar that Spa Fawn didn't have a servant ask us our business? Or have you disarm? Everyone has a different modus. Sometimes it's defined by tradition and not logic. If nothing else, it indicates that Fawn isn't afraid of us. Den nodded in the direction of their diminutive guide. Why should he be with a bodyguard like that? Spa Fawn was waiting for them in a chamber that was, thankfully, high enough to allow Jax to stand erect. Whether the Nooknog had arranged it out of courtesy to customers and contacts bigger than himself, or whether it simply reflected the existing architecture was open to question. Spafon sat on a thick yellow cushion, his small blue servant taking up a stance beside him. Fawn's hospitality might include a ceiling of reasonable height, but it evidently did not extend to furniture. His visitors were obliged to either stand or make use of similar cushions. Den dropped gratefully onto one of the pillows. It took Jax a moment to fold his longer legs beneath him. The position brought back a quick flash of memory. He felt as if he were back in beginning levitation class, trying to absorb the teachings of Master Yerim. The sharp jab of longing for such simpler times surprised him with its intensity. Impatient, as were most of his kind, Spafon scowled at them. Epa tells me you're here on business. I don't recognize either of you. Give me a reference or I'll have you thrown out. At this, the lawn chair tilted back his head and assumed an air of unmistakable haughtiness. Relax. Den made a soothing gesture. We're here on the recommendation of Shulfa, the Vernal. Ah, that sly slink. The Nooknog let out a sniff of approval. What's old wart face up to? Oh, the usual, Jax responded casually. Business is good. In fact, we were told that when we met up with you, we were to solicit additional stock on his behalf. The high-ridged head bobbed appreciatively. Such stash as Shulfa requires is not easy to come by. Exclusive goods are as well guarded as they are regarded by his customers. But tell him I will see what I can do. Now then... He shifted his lumpy backside on the luxurious cushion. What brings you to me specifically? Dan looked at Jax, who nodded encouragingly. The Celestin turned back to their host. You provided Shulfa with two Vesvolet originals. He'd like more. The Nooknog rolled his eyes in opposite directions. I bet he would, the old bug-eater. Does he think volets are like shafts of wandering sunlight to be gathered freely with a photon net? 
since the artist was killed. It was the opening Jax had been waiting for. Casually, offhandedly, he said, Yes, that was a gifted bit of work on your part. I'm curious as to how you managed it. Managed it? The Nooknog's tone took an abrupt turn toward the unpleasant. Beside him, the lawn chair stiffened. I managed no such thing. Why would you accuse me of such an act? Well, it's intuitively obvious, Den said. You stole from the artist two of his works, which you then flogged to Shulfa at considerable profit. So you tried it again, but this time Valet had prepared for a similar break-in. Or perhaps your timing was bad and you encountered him by accident. In the ensuing struggle, you killed him. Not that we care. Spafon glanced at the lawn chair, who blinked in response. When the Nook-Nog turned back to his guests, it was clear from the narrowing of his eyes that he now saw them in a new and not nearly as favorable light. I think that you do care very much. I think maybe, in fact, that you're police, here to try to get me to confess to a crime I didn't commit because you can't solve it any other way. We're not police, Jax began honestly. We're... And, the Nook-Nog interrupted, I think it's time for you to leave. Raising a reddish bony arm, their host gestured. The curtain covering the back wall parted, and a shape emerged. As it stepped into the room behind Spa Fawn, Jax recognized the species, Cathar. Feline in appearance, covered in thick gold to yellow-brown fur, and clad in a leather vest and kilt, it stood much taller than him, and probably massed three times his weight. Beneath the fur, Jax could see, was mostly muscle. Well, Den said briskly, edging backward toward the exit. Obviously, you have other appointments, so we'll just be... Den froze as the Cathar took a step forward. On his head, between the pointed ears, he wore a diadem of silvery metal fronted by a single Mangana Aqua Cabochon. That meant something in Cathar culture Jax knew. He just couldn't remember what. He took a deep breath. There's no need for this, Spafon. We're all friends here. The Nooknog glared at him. Friends do not accuse friends of murder. I'm sure it was an accident. It was his sculptures he wanted, not his life. Smiling broadly, the Jedi spread his arms wide. Hey, there's no shame in admitting to an accident. I'm glad you feel that way, replied Fawn. So you'll experience no hard feelings over the accident that is about to befall you both now. The Cathar approached Jax, ignoring Den. I am silly, he growled. I will pull out your tibia and use it to pick my teeth. Snarling, the leader of the Nooknog's bodyguard exposed sharp white canines. Is this any way to treat customers? As Jax took a step backward, his right hand slid inconspicuously to his waist. You can't make deals in a hostile atmosphere. Why don't we all take a breath and... Letting out a roar that shook the room, Seely reached out for Jax with one huge paw. Though the Cathar was faster than one might expect for a creature of such bulk, Jax was considerably more nimble. Dodging to his left, he drew and activated the Velmorian flame sword in a single motion. The Cathar paused a moment at this unexpected move. He was, however, completely confident in his ability to subdue any hostile interlopers. Given his size and strength, it was an assurance not misplaced. But he had, in all probability, never faced a Jedi before. Seely drew a poniard as long and heavy as the Jedi's leg. Ducking beneath a swing powerful enough to decapitate a reek, Jax leaned forward in a long thrust that sent the tip of the flame sword through the Cathar's fur and a centimeter deep into his thigh. Howling, the bodyguard stepped back and swatted at the smoke rising from his singed fur. When he looked up again, his expression was by itself enough to paralyze a typical opponent. Now I remember the significance of the headband, Jax thought. It signifies him as the mightiest warrior of his clan. It figures. Rushing forward, Seely brought the weighty blade of the poniard down in a swipe that would have cut the Jedi in half from crown to crotch, had it landed, which it did not. 
Dodging right this time, Jax fainted with the flame sword. His adversary sidestepped left. Jax whirled, leapt with the force's aid, and brought the Velmorian weapon down. Flinching, Seely managed to block the blow, but the overflow from the sword seared a black streak across his right shoulder. For the second time, the Cathar let out a howl of pain. Though he had lightly wounded his opponent twice, the Jedi knew that Seely had to land only one of his substantial blows to win the fight. He continued his strategy, using the Force to keep him just out of his foe's reach while letting the laws of physics work in his favor. At his mass and size, there was simply no way the Cathar could move as quickly or as nimbly as Jack's, even without the Force's aid. At last, smoldering like a house afire from more than a dozen slashing wounds inflicted by Jax's flame sword, Seely had no choice but to acquiesce to his opponent. The hulking creature bent one leg and bowed his head. He laid the poniard on the floor between them. By the rules of the blood hunt, he said in a throaty growl, I surrender to you all that I own and all that I am. Accepted. Breathing hard, Jax turned to face the still-seated and now obviously stunned figure of Spa Fawn. The lawn chair was nowhere to be seen. Bad business, Jack said. Something like this could ruin your reputation if word got out. The fence didn't reply. He just sat and stared. Don't you agree, Den? Jax continued. Den. Turning away from the seemingly paralyzed Nooknog, Jax searched the room with his gaze and the force. Where was Den? Interesting thing, reputations. They're so often undeserved. Stepping from behind the same dividing curtain that had earlier revealed the now chastised bodyguard, the Celestin rejoined his companion. Squirming beneath his right arm, but failing to break free, was the lawn chair. With a flourish, Den dumped him in front of the Jedi. My friend, meet the real Spa Fawn. Jax looked from their supposed host down to the slightly built lawn chair. Your Spa Fawn? Don't hurt me, the lawn chair whimpered. Black spots of panic had broken out all over his body. His four eyes were rolling in so many directions at once that looking at them made Jax dizzy. I'm just a simple dealer in wanted goods, the bona fide spa fawn whined. I take, but I don't harm. Don't hit me, please. Jax noticed that the thick patois the lawn chair had affected earlier had been replaced by perfectly understandable basic. Off to the side, Seely growled something unflattering under his breath. The unabashed display of cowardice on the part of his former employer forced the Cathar to look away, lest he share in the lawn chair's shame. Den gestured toward Jax. My friend spoke the truth. We're not police. We're independent contractors doing a job. Except we don't hide behind the disguised droid. He looked contemptuously back at the bogus Nooknog. Now for the last time, how and why did you murder the artist Vess Volette? Four desperate eyes goggled up at the Celestin and the Jedi. I didn't, I didn't. Not I, nor any of my people. Sure, I wanted more of his light sculptures. They're quick and easy money. But I swear, I steal, but I don't kill. Jax leaned forward and reached out. The force that he perceived as linear extensions of himself, as threads of purposeful intangibility, touched the pitiful creature lying before him. It took only a moment. He's telling the truth. What now? Dan asked as they headed back toward the terminal. Back to our place, Jack said. I have Renan engaged in some research on an unrelated matter that I want to check on. Dan shrugged. Whatever. He checked his chrono. Just as well. It's almost happy hour. Nineteen. Renan sat before his access console, pondering his next action. It had seemed a simple enough appeal from Jax. Find out everything still extant about his father, Lorne Pavan, a small-time information broker, 
dealer in stolen goods, and before that, clerical assistant employed by the Jedi Temple. All of this two decades and more in the past. A straightforward request for anyone save one of the Elomen, who were accustomed to seeing labyrinthine complexities and subterfuge beneath the surface of anything that seemed initially innocent. The fact that Jax had also enjoined him not to speak of this task to I-5 only added to Renan's suspicion. He had made it seem casual enough, like an afterthought. Oh, and by the way, but his studied insouciance only made Renan the more wary of a hidden agenda. For an Eloman, the concern was never about being too paranoid. It was about being paranoid enough. Open channel, he murmured to the console. The hollow proj responded by showing him the gateway to the hollow net. Renan interlaced his fingers and pushed his palms out, limbering up his digits and cracking his knuckles. Then he bent over the instrumentation projection. Five hours later, he pushed back his form-fit chair and stretched, feeling the muscles of his rachis reluctantly unkink. He was too deep in thought to be aware of the trilling sound made by the passage of his breath over his vibrating tusks. There was much to think about. What he'd managed to put together was fascinating. Jax's father had been a minor-level accountant and file clerk for the Jedi, until his two-year-old son had been found to have higher-than-normal midichlorian levels. The elder Pavan had been approached by representatives of the council, who'd urged that young Jax be taken into the temple as a Padawan. It was, Renan knew, considered quite an honor to have one's child offered an opportunity to become a Jedi Knight even though it meant giving up that child forever to the cloistered corridors of the Order. Few parents turned down the Jedi, because it also meant a secure, honorable, and purposeful life for their offspring, which was something all parents wanted. Lorne and his wife Sienna had resisted, however. Though not rich, they were by no means destitute, and the thought of giving up their only child, even though it might be deemed in his best interests, horrified them. Reports as to what happened next were conflicting. Lorne had either quit his job or been let go, and the child, Jax, had been either taken by or given freely to the Order, although a grievance filed by the parents was on the public record, accusing the Jedi of what amounted to kidnapping. Renan got the impression that there had been collusion in high places to bury the story, even before Lorne's name was linked to the missing Namoidian holocron. In any event, Nothing had come of the grievance. Sienna Pavan had left her husband not long after, and Lorne had begun a long downward spiral, literally as well as figuratively, that had eventually deposited him on the mean streets of Coruscant's underworld. Here he had met the protocol droid I-5, and the two had begun their singular partnership. All this was public record, or had been before the data purge of anything having to do with the Jedi. Even so, it had been relatively easy to suss out. The next stage of Lorne's saga, however, had been systematically and thoroughly purged. The shunting, decryption, and maneuvering around countless pyro walls had taken much time and patience. Renan had painstakingly applied enhancement and reconstruction of the various data bins, some of which had been removed from the vaults, leaving only quantum residual traces. At some points, he'd had to rely on nodal seeker algorithms to reconstruct and best guess the graph probabilities of the data conduits. It hadn't been easy. Obviously, the story he was trying so scrupulously to piece together had been thoroughly scrubbed by orders from someone very much on high. He'd had to move cautiously indeed to avoid the myriad alarms, tripwires, and deadfalls that lay in wait around every virtual corner. And when he'd finally disengaged from the hunt, the story was still by and large piecemeal. The essence of it was simple enough. Lorne Pavan and his droid partner had come into possession of a data holocron containing intel concerning the Nemoidian trade embargo of the planet Naboo that had occurred 23 years previous. Renan wasn't able to ascertain the exact nature of the intel, but it was obviously severely compromising to at least one highly placed government official, if not more. In response to this, a death mark was issued on Pavan, and by extension, I-5. 
So far, his extensive and exhaustive reconstruction of past events had yielded little that hadn't already been vouchsafed by I-5. What Jax was most curious to know was the identity of the mysterious assassin, as well as his employer. These data were buried the deepest, and took the most effort to exhume. I found nothing but rumor, essentially, he told Jax later. The Imperial Security Bureau categorically condemns all such speculation as innuendo and calumny, and the slightest suspicion of illegal interest is enough to warrant an investigation by the Inquisitorius. My slicing past their pyro walls did not activate any alarms, which is how I intend to keep it. What I have discovered is everything I can get without putting us all at great risk. Don't ask me to investigate further. I won't chance a cerebral meltdown for you or anyone. I will tell you this once, and then I intend to forget it. Make of it what you will, but know that you didn't learn it from me. It is, at best, hearsay. A fragment of a sector police communique dated as closely as I can determine, approximately 18 years ago, from the time of the Nabu trade embargo, mentions the death of a hut nightclub owner and local racketeer, along with several of his minions, at the hands of a Zabrak assassin. The killer's targets were apparently a human male, most likely of Corellian or Alderanian origin, and a protocol droid. I-5 and my father, Jax murmured. Almost certainly, Renan agreed. They escaped and were pursued by the Zabrak. That correlates with what I-5 told me. The thing he refuses to specify is the assassin's identity. If my suspicions are correct, the yellowman said, he had a good reason for not doing so. He paused. Tell me, Jack said. He felt the hairs on his arms and the back of his neck rising in anticipation. Renan said, The weapon used by the Zabrak was a double-bladed lightsaber. A red lightsaber. Jax stared at him. A Sith? The Elloman regarded him impassively. You tell me. But... Jax felt his mind whirling. According to Temple lore, a Sith Lord's lightsaber was always red, constructed by following an ancient secret formula. It had been thus ever since Darth Bane had instituted the rule of two more than a thousand years ago. In addition, the Jedi had traditionally eschewed the use of double-bladed lightsabers. The style and color of the Zabrak's weapon, therefore, all but guaranteed his identity to be that of a Sith. His father had been killed by a Sith. And I-5 had known this. Twenty. When they returned to Poloda Place, Den immediately noticed that I-5 was still jacked into the holonet. Plugged in, jacked in, turned on, wired up. However, an organic chose to describe the condition. It was the mech mind, state of oneness with other artificial intelligences. Den knew that, while in that state, the droid could exchange information instantly without having to first translate it to basic and then back again. He could receive replies at the same speed, instead of waiting for the cybernetic equivalent of hours for an organic to finish a couple of sentences. It did no good, the droid had told him more than once, to try to explain such things to organics. Even those with whom he had surrounded himself, who were smarter and more empathic than most, could at best only nod courteously and declare their understanding. When in reality it was plain they understood nothing, and that their comprehension was irredeemably restricted by the limitations imposed on their thought processes by the very nature of their protein-based synaptic connections. He gave them credit for trying, though, especially Den, who, like most of his kind, was sharp of mind as well as tongue. Jax immediately met with Renan, and the two of them disappeared into an antechamber to talk. A few moments later, Jax re-entered the room, his expression grim. He crossed to the wall where the droid was jacked into the interface. I-5, he said tightly. We need to talk. Something in his tone made Den take notice. It also got through to I-5. The droid removed his digit from the interface socket and turned to face Jax. 
The Jedi glanced at Loranth and Dan. Can we have the room, please? Loranth nodded and left. On the way out, she grabbed Dan by the shoulder. Come on, she said. Den thought briefly about resisting, but only briefly. The Twi'lek was much stronger than he was. No fair, he protested feebly. If this is about the case, shouldn't we be there too? It's not about the case, Loranth said. How can you know? You're a reporter, she said. How can you not? I-5 said mildly. How may I help you, Jax? Jax repressed an urge to grab and shake the droid knowing that it would do no good. The man who killed my father was a Sith. Why didn't you tell me? What good would it have done? What harm would it have done? As a Jedi in particular, I had a right to know. And now that you know, the droid said with maddening complacency, what do you plan to do? Well, I... Jax paused, realizing that he'd formed no real course of action. I'll find out if this Sith still lives, he said somewhat lamely, and, and no doubt get yourself arrested and tortured by the Inquisitorious, I-5 finished. It's a new order out there, remember? If the assassin is still alive, a low probability given the attrition rate in his kind of work, he is not the hunted. You are. He was acting under orders, Jack said, orders from very high up, orders that may possibly have come from Palpatine himself. And? When Jax didn't reply, the droid continued, Do you dream of taking the fight to the Emperor? Weren't you the one who told me not too long ago that the very concept teeters on madness? You're doing everything one life form can do, Jax, a great deal more than most do. Would you throw it all away to avenge someone you never even knew? I knew Lorne Pavan better than anyone, I dare say. I can call up memories of him that seem as real as you. And I'm certain he would tell you to let the past care for the dead. So you didn't tell me his killer was a Sith because you knew that I'd feel honor-bound, both as his son and as a Jedi, to bring closure to all this? Jax shook his head in disbelief. How? You didn't even know me at the time. I knew your father, I-5 said and I came to know the Jedi over the years. And I saw the Zabrak. Nothing could stop him. Lorne wouldn't have wanted you cut down like he was. Jax's head was spinning. If there was the faintest possibility that a Sith did still exist, it was his duty as a Jedi to hunt him down. Added to that was the urge to avenge the father he never knew but he had to admit that I-5 was making a lot of sense. As a Jedi, his first duty was to help the people, not pursue personal vendettas. Also, the galaxy had changed. To be identified as a Jedi Knight now wasn't the automatic ticket to awe and respect that it once had been. But he couldn't simply let it go. I-5 said quietly, I was wrong not to tell you everything, Jax. It's not my right to choose your path. But now that you know, should you decide to investigate this further, I can at least help level the playing field. So saying, he opened the hatch to a small hidden aperture in his chest plate, in what would be the upper left quadrant of a human's torso. He reached into the chest compartment and withdrew a small vial. After a moment, Jax recognized the clear tube, about the size and length of his index finger as the vaporizer delivery ampule for a non-invasive epidermic injector commonly referred to as a skin popper. This is, as far as I can determine, the sole remaining sample of Bota extract in the galaxy, the droid said. Bota was a broad-based, ergogenic plant native to Drongar. I've heard of it, Jack said. It was the reason the Separatists and the Republic fought there, until it mutated and became worthless. Yes, it is, was, what's commonly known as an adaptogen, a panacea that has various, mostly salutary effects on differing species. To Nemoidians, it's a narcotic, to Huts, a psychedelic, to humans, an antibiotic, and so on. During her tour of duty as a healer, 
Jedi Beresoff, he accidentally discovered that a dose of the distillate greatly enhanced her connection to the Force. She described it as being linked to all beings, all places, throughout all times. The droid hesitated, then added, Jedi Offi wasn't one to overly indulge in hyperbole, so I assume that her assessment was a straightforward one, metaphysical as it may sound. I believe you, Jax replied. How did you come into possession of it? When I finally finished reconstructing my synaptic grid links, I remembered that I'd made a promise to Lorne once. He asked me to watch over you, if you'll recall. Hard to forget with you reminding me at every opportunity. Jedi Offie offered me the privileged status of being an envoy to the temple by carrying the distillate with me back to Coruscant. When Dan and I arrived, however, there were no Jedi to deliver it to. Until you found me. Jax looked at the ampule, held it up to the light, admiring its translucence. It reminded him for some reason of the Pyronium nugget. But why didn't you give it to me when we first met? Again, I-5 hesitated uncharacteristically. Because, he said at last, you're one of the last few surviving Jedi. I had to make sure that I was worthy, that I wouldn't use the boat uh, in the service of the dark side. Forgive me. I had to be certain. According to Jedi Offi, the enhanced connection with the Force is potentially so powerful that were it to fall into the wrong hands, the results could be cataclysmic. She felt that it opened a channel to what she referred to as the cosmic force. I assume you know what she was referring to. Jax nodded, lost in thought. Most philosophers and students of the force, including many members of the erstwhile council, believed that the force was above intellectual concepts of good and evil, and that the terms light side and dark side constituted nothing more than a merism. Nevertheless, many also felt a case could be made for viewing the Force, as it was generally understood and utilized, as a subset of a grander and all-pervasive unifying principle. It was this living Force that was the aspect most Jedi, and most Sith as well, were familiar with. If one's connection with it was strong enough, one could accomplish what seemed to most folk to be miracles, telekinesis, healing abilities, supernal strength, speed, and stamina, even a certain amount of precognition. But according to the old teachings, this was only one aspect of a greater whole, much as one planar surface represented only a fraction of a hypergem's multidimensional wonders, known variously as the unifying, cosmic, or greater force. One connected with the greater force only through a lifetime of meditation and sacrifice. But the reward of doing so was, it was said, a unification with all of space and time, an ability to manipulate matter and energy on the most elemental levels, even, it was said by some, the ability to throw off the shackles of the flesh in favor of an immortal body of energy. If Bota Extract lived up to Barisofi's description, it would seem to offer a shortcut to the enlightenment of the greater force, if it could indeed potentiate the effects of his body's midichlorians to such an unprecedented degree, and if it could make such power available to any force-sensitive. Well then, cataclysmic was definitely an understatement. If Vader were to somehow learn of it, Jax couldn't finish the thought. But then another thought, even more frightening, occurred to him. What if he already knows? What if Vader knew somehow that Jax was intended to be the recipient of the extract? He might not know the exact time or vector of its delivery, might not suspect that it had been carried to Imperial Center by a mere protocol droid. But if he had any foreknowledge at all, either through the Force or simply through mundane intel, of the miracle distillate's properties, that was surely reason enough for his unflagging pursuit of Jax. He said as much to I-5. The droid agreed, adding, Perhaps it would be best to hide it, ideally by someone else, in a place unknown to you, so that a truth scan wouldn't reveal its whereabouts. Jax looked again at the clear amber liquid in the ampule. 
You had to pick a time like this to tell me about it. And a better time would have been... Jax had no answer for that. 21. The meeting room wasn't large. It was hidden behind a false wall in the kitchen of a charity that fed the homeless and hungry representatives of several species. It was surprisingly crowded, however. Jax found himself standing against the rear wall as the cell's leader spoke from the makeshift forum at the front of the room. That the partisans had passion and were driven by determination could not be denied. Passion and determination were, however, poor substitutes for star destroyers and divisions of stormtroopers. The speaker was a gossam, elaborately dressed in the style favored by his people. His tone was sharp and his words eloquent. His passion was easy to understand. Among the non-human species, Gossams had been especially singled out by the Emperor for continued persecution. Hear me well, disgruntled masses. First the stormtroopers will come for the peaceful non-humans, such as the Gossams and the Kamasi. Then they will come for the defiant non-humans. Then the humans who object and finally they will turn upon and devour themselves in an orgy of mindless destruction and self-loathing, until the galaxy turns back to barbarism and all semblance of kindness, decency, and civilization is lost. It went on in that vein for some time, individual members of the audience frequently murmuring their agreement. There was no applause. The speaker's words were too solemn for applause. Jax listened with half a mind the other half being occupied with studying those in attendance. In addition to the humans, there was a representative smattering of sentience from all across the galaxy, as he had known there would be. The whiplash drew support even from some of those species seemingly favored by the government. As a member of the subversive organization, he attended the clandestine meetings whenever he could to reacquaint himself with familiar faces and to meet new ones as well. A tall and elderly human female took the podium from the exhausted Gossam and started talking about organizations similar to the Whiplash that were forming on other worlds. Jack sat up. This was news to him, as it no doubt would have been to the general media. Was the government aware of these stirrings? If so, it would behoove the imperial authorities to keep such knowledge quiet. A cluster of malcontents on one world was easily monitored. Individual groups of dissenters were each separately, a simple matter to contain. The woman was talking not merely of groups with similar ideas and aims, however, but of the first threads of cooperation among them. Of the whiplash, not simply talking to like-minded factions on other worlds, but of linking up with them. Of not just speaking out, but taking action. What she was describing went deeper and broader than resistance. She was promoting organized rebellion. Not for now, not even for tomorrow. The advocates of resistance were too scattered and too few to risk anything like direct confrontation with the government. But the first notions, the preliminary inklings, were there, scattered throughout her speech. Some in the audience were moved to tears, others to cries to take up arms immediately. The speaker calmed the latter, even as she dissuaded them. It was not yet time. Preparations had to be made, measures needed to be taken, the groundwork had to be laid. A now riveted Jax listened intently to every word. Clearly, the whiplash was becoming more than just an avenue for getting dissidents safely off-world. There was purpose growing behind it, and individuals who were dedicated and empowered just individuals, he wondered, or were certain planetary governments disenchanted with the direction Palpatine was taking, having second or third thoughts about aligning themselves with the newly proclaimed empire. After the human finished speaking, the meeting broke up. Some attendees departed quietly and in haste. Others remained, gathering in small groups to further discuss the ideas that had been presented. The speakers had removed themselves quickly, departing one at a time and in different directions, so that if any happened to be followed and picked up for questioning, their arraignment would not imperil their fellows. Jax was leaving, too. 
when a sturdily built older human crossed his path and raised a hand. Your pardon, citizen. The man's gaze dropped to the deactivated weapon partly concealed at the Jedi's waist. I couldn't help but notice the unusual weapon you're carrying. If I'm not mistaken, it's a Velmorian flame sword. An unconventional weapon, but one that can still be quite effective. You have a good eye for tradition, friend. Jax resumed walking. The man fell in alongside him. Weapons are something of a passion of mine, he stated. There are few outside Velmore who could handle such a weapon with any skill. He eyed the increasingly uncomfortable younger man intently. You are not Velmorian. No, I'm not. Jax lengthened his stride. The persistent stranger kept pace. Please don't misconstrue my curiosity. He indicated the meeting room behind them. We are all here for the same reason. We share the same purpose. A discontent with the way things are. We are all renegades. Jax slowed slightly. Probing with the force revealed nothing hostile within the stranger. A tremendous intensity, yes but nothing to suggest that he might be an enemy. Still, it was best to be cautious. He stopped and looked at his questioner. Though he was dressed in nondescript civilian garb, there was the unmistakable air of the military about him. He looked like he knew how to handle himself in a fight, and the antiquated eye patch did nothing to dispel that impression. Was there something you wanted from me, citizen, or did you just want to compliment me on my taste in personal armament? No. The man responded apologetically. I meant no intrusion. The flame sword caught my eye was all. That and an admitted curiosity to know what sort of person could effectively wield such a device. Other than a Velmorian trained in its use from childhood, one would think only a Jedi might have such skill. Jax tensed. But though he probed deeply with the Force, there was still nothing threatening about this pushy interrogator. Certainly nothing to suggest he might be a government agent or a representative of the sector police. You have me all wrong, friend. I'm just a hobbyist who picked this blade up at a market sell-through. I don't really know how to use it, but I like the way it rides at my waist, and the sight of it is enough to scare off those who might try to cheat me. I see. The man seemed disappointed, but willing to accept the younger human's explanation at face value. At... What, would they try to cheat you, that you would feel the need of such a weapon to wave at them? Jack's thought quickly. They were approaching the exit to the street, and this conversation was approaching its end. I'm a gambler, so I often have large sums of credits on me. He extended a hand. It was nice to meet a fellow dissident, but I really have to be on my way. And I as well, confessed the stranger. Might I know your name, young gambler? After a moment's concern, Jax decided, why not? He was never going to see this fellow again. In another moment, the underlevels of Imperial Center would swallow them both. Jax Pavan. And you are? The man appeared to hesitate, but not enough to unsettle Jax. As before, there was no sense of hostility or threat within him. As they shook hands in farewell, he said, I am Captain Typho late of Her Majesty's Naboo Royal Security Forces. 22. The droid was fast, Den had to give it that. Fast and sneaky. It popped up suddenly from behind a pile of rubble, firing four quick shots at Laurent. For all its speed, however, the paladin was quicker. She whirled, her blasters clearing leather, even as she crouched and turned, firing five shots in response. Each of the first four blocked an incoming charged particle beam. The fifth shot nailed the droid right between the photoreceptors. And the crowd goes wild, Den said. He was relaxing in a dilapidated form-fit divan with his feet up on an old console cabinet, watching the Twi'lek going through her ritual with polite interest. If we're ever attacked by a training droid, I have no worries about the outcome. Laurent ignored him. She dialed the intensity scale on her twin DLs back into the lethal zone before returning them to their holsters. Then she reactivated the training droid and sent it back to its charging niche. Dan yawned. Think Jax is getting back from the get-together yet? When he is, we'll know, she replied. 
or rather I'll know. Cub, I wish I'd had that all-purpose intuition mojo like the force back when I was a reporter. Would have come in awfully handy some. Lorant made a quick lateral slicing movement with her left hand, its intensity rendering the fierce accompanying shh superfluous. Den shut up. He watched the Twi'lek. She stood straight in an attitude of listening. The passion with which she sought to connect with the Force was so obvious, he half expected the fleshy tentacles her species wore in lieu of hair to rise like organic antennae, aiding her in her quest. She stood for a long moment, as if carved from jade, then abruptly looked at him and said, Tell Jax I had to investigate something. Without waiting for a response, she stepped back into the resiplex, emerging a moment later clad in a hooded cloak. You sure you want to go out there alone? Den knew the question was foolish. If ever a creature existed who was designed for the mean streets of Coruscant, if ever urban natural selection had produced a predator better at stalking the city planet's Duracrete jungles than Loranth Tarek, the Celestin didn't want to be in the same universe with it. Still. Wait for Jax, he urged her. Whatever the talking about at the whiplash meeting can't be nearly as important as whatever you're up to looks to be. Loranth shook her head. It could be nothing. I'll be back this evening, most likely, she said. Then before he could say anything more, she walked away into the night. Ara Singh's nostrils flared, almost as if she could actually smell her quarry. In a sense, she could, if one could attribute something of that sense to the Force. Here, she said silently to herself, and close. Making her way steadily but unobtrusively through the crowds, she smiled her feral smile. She wasn't 100% certain that it was Jack's Pavan she was about to encounter, but it was someone steeped in the Force. Of that she had no doubt. The trail brought her to an ongoing fun fair in one of the deeper sublevels. Here there were Tri-D arcades, virtual rides, exhibitions from the farthest reaches of the galaxy, or at least what claimed to be such, and other attractions. Singh let herself be swept along in the polymorphic crowds, keeping her awareness extended. Where are you, young Jedi? Where are you hiding in this hive of filthy, useless souls? I am coming for you. The Dark Lord wants you. This is easy for me. Don't think you have a chance of defeating me. I've killed Jedi far more skilled than you. A lover of chaos and confusion, Singh delighted in the funfair's surroundings, where deafening noises and eye-smiting illumination, along with the multifarious commingling of species, all came together to produce a bedlam that she found pleasurable. Many of the attractions were genuinely clever. There was a carabor where one didn't just have the opportunity to race flying starships or participate as a crew member, one could also become the starship. In a neural stim booth, one felt as if one was temporarily transformed into a thing of metal and composite, circuits and lights, weapons and engines. In the droid dome, similar virtual realities gave any sentient the temporary appearance and persona of a droid, from security to construction, from translator to engineer. Real droids found this particular entertainment mildly obscene, not to mention unrealistic. The worst that a customer could experience did not extend to such real-world droid tribulations as casual disposal or dismemberment. There were high-tech, massively multiplayer, multi-species combat games, food and drink to sample from one end of the galaxy to another, live shows that one species would find unremittingly dry and another utterly hilarious, as well as body-switching simulations that permitted one to experience another species' physicality or gender or sensorium. Size distorters gave one the perspective of a giant or a germ. Transport sims from any known planets let one walk, float, or fly around the surface of a multitude of worlds. Singh ignored them all. With her white epidermis, skin-tight jumpsuit, lithe figure, and shock of red hair geysering from her otherwise bald skull, she drew many intent looks from other patrons, some from wildly different species, 
To each, she responded in one of two ways, by ignoring them, or by giving them a look as hard and intense and burning as the open core of a nuclear reactor. Where are you, young Jedi? Where are you, Jax Pavan? She ignored the tempting diversions through which she strode, ignored food and liquor, and proffered stimulations of other kinds, ignored come-ons and thoughtless invective, swiping hands and assurances of instant wealth loudly promised. Nothing could divert her from her task. Close now, she told herself. She could practically taste her quarry, could visualize the shock that would freeze his expression as she tickled his navel with the tip of her lightsaber. Not that she needed anything to encourage her stalking, but her claustrophobic surroundings, underground and filled with shoving, jostling representatives of numerous species, reminded her of nothing so much as the Xenium mines on Uvo IV. Very close now. An occasional celebrant caught a glimpse of her face, the look in her eyes, and made haste to get as far out of the way of the fast-moving white humanoid as possible. And then abruptly, she found herself before the entrance to one of the fair's main amusements, a hollow house. Whoever the Force-sensitive she'd been tracking was, and she was virtually positive it was her quarry, the Force told her that its association with the entity Jax Pavan was very strong indeed. He was somewhere inside the building. She could simply storm in by the simple expedient of removing the head of the humanoid checking entrance, but that would draw unwanted attention. And this proximate to her prey, that was the last thing Singh wanted. Despite her rising level of excitement, she forced herself to lower her heart rate and respiration. Look normal, she told herself. Relaxed, calm just a single working woman out for an evening's entertainment, which wasn't that far off the mark. She paid the entry fee, was assured the building was not crowded, and entered. The attraction was like a house of mirrors, only without the mirrors. In their place, illuminated laser lines crisscrossed multiple levels. At the intersection of any two, a hollow image of one or another visitant from anywhere else in the place might appear. Being a hollow proj, the image wasn't mirror reversed. There was no way to distinguish it from reality. Reach out, and your hand would pass through the image, be it one of yourself or someone else. You could step through it and onto another pathway or level, unless, of course, it was not an image, but an actual being. The result was confusion, bemusement, mistaken identity, and, ideally, widespread hilarity. Any vestige of the last emotion, however, was absent from the bounty hunter as she moved purposefully through the maze. Laughter and conversation from other distant visitors echoed through the passageways. Singh had her lightsaber out, but had not yet activated it. No need to alarm the paying customers or to alert her target. Clenched in her gloved right fist, much of the gleaming metal was hidden from view. If necessary, she could bring it to full activation in less than a second. She passed a handsome young couple amusing themselves by kissing their respective images and felt her lip curl. Foolish, wasted lives, there for a few brief seconds and then gone in an instant, vanishing without ever having impacted the fabric of civilization. Not like her, Singh told herself. She had an effect. She made a difference. Perhaps not one that those who encountered her took pleasure from, but certainly one that they and those around them would long remember, assuming they survived. Finding someone in the place was next to impossible without the Force's aid. The multiplicity of levels, roots, and images offered too many choices for most people. Ara Singh, however, would have been able to track her quarry through the lambent maze, even had she been blind and deaf. The Force was her guide. A touch of the dark side was all that was needed to lead her through the multiple images, levels, and corridors. Until... There, right in front of her, no more than five meters away, stood the target, clad in a cloak and cowl and looking in the opposite direction. Singh's fingers tightened around the haft of her lightsaber. Moving silently, she drew near. 
As she did so, several replicated images of herself appeared to her left, right, and overhead. Each was equally determined, each equally grim. It was too easy. Singh hesitated. She could feel the force emanating from her target, but could sense no suspicion, no wariness. Why didn't he sense her approach? Insufficient training, perhaps. Not properly attuned. Vader had told her that Pavan was hardly a master of the discipline. No matter, the Force was clearly present here. If this was in fact her quarry, she would bring him back alive to the Dark Lord. If not, then he was just another rogue Jedi or a Force-sensitive, and either way she would be allowed the pleasure of the kill. But she would not strike without first seeing the face of her victim. For the bounty hunter, this was not a matter of ethics. It was all about personal satisfaction. Clutching the lightsaber in her right hand, her thumbs pressured just short of activating it, she reached out with the force across the few meters separating them and gently touched the individual standing before her. Light as Singh's mental goad was, the figure whirled at the sensation. The hood of the overcape fell back and Singh's gaze met the others. Singh had just time enough to register that it was a female Twi'lek who stood before her. Then, before she realized it, her lightsaber was activated and parrying blasts from the twin DL-44s in the other's hands. Singh threw herself sideways. Half a dozen replications of herself duplicated the move with unnatural precision. Lightsaber whirling, she not only deflected incoming fire, but struck back as well, knocking the bolts back toward her foe. Using the force, the Twi'lek leapt upward to the next level of the structure. The multiple images of herself that accompanied the jump offered no protection from a killer whose eyes could be deceived, but to whom the Force spoke clearly. Singh was right behind her. Spinning, whirling, jumping, she deflected every shot fired in her direction. A glimpse of one of her doppelgangers showed her lightsaber moving so fast she appeared to be engulfed in a sphere of green fire. But the Twi'lek's aim was better than it had any right to be. It was on the same skill level as that of someone taught in the temple. A bolt from one of the blasters slipped past Singh's whirling lightsaber and singed her left shoulder. The bounty hunter gritted her teeth and slashed an opening in one of the plastiform walls. Several surprised customers, seeing the fearsome form and a number of attendant images of her appear through the wall, fled screaming. This wasn't going well. The combination of the kaleidoscopic images and the panic-stricken civilians caused her grasp on the force to briefly lessen. It was only for a fraction of a second, but that was enough time to allow the real Twi'lek to land a punch on her jaw that caused the world to momentarily dim. Enough of this, Singh decided. She had a mission to perform, and although her opponent wasn't the Jedi she'd been sent for, the Twi'lek was still somehow connected to her prey. She would have to be taken alive and questioned. Easier said than done, however. Eluding a complex swing of her lightsaber, the Twi'lek managed for just an instant to get under Singh's guard. She fired. Singh felt the heat of the bolt and barely succeeded, aided by the force in arching backward enough for it to miss her face. Her high left cheek instantly acquired a four-by-one centimeter sunburn. The dangerously close miss was enough to compel her to do something she had not done in some time. She pulled her own blaster. Handling the lightsaber with her right hand, she snapped off several bolts with the blaster gripped in her left. One burst caught the Twi'lek unprepared, blowing a hole in the floor beneath her feet. When the dust cleared, the Twi'lek was nowhere to be seen. Reluctantly, Singh decided that it was time to break off the confrontation. In the distance, she could hear the warning squeal of approaching police skimmers. Although her imperial ident would extricate her from any confrontation with minor officials, she did not want anything that might be perceived as a failure getting back to Lord Vader. While she didn't doubt her ability to take the Twi'lek alive, she had now realized that her antagonist was most likely a member of the Grey Paladins. The blasters were the clue. That meant she was a Jedi, and not likely to be very forthcoming about a fellow Jedi's whereabouts, even under torture. Add to that the very likely possibility that... If Singh was circumspect enough, she might be able to follow the paladin back to Pavan without arousing suspicion, and she was left with only one sensible choice. 
Gathering herself, Ara Singh thrust her lightsaber over her head and leapt straight upward, smashing through two floors. She landed on the roof, then leapt again and again, using the force to augment the power of her muscles, until she was beyond the fair's boundaries. Then she stopped and waited. She could sense the Twi'lek's force connection, could tell if it was coming toward her instead of going away. For several minutes, the blip on her mental radar stayed mostly in the same area, no doubt because the paladin was searching the hollow house for her. But then it began to move slowly away from her. A grim sing began to follow. This time she would be more circumspect, would bide her time until the situation was less crowded, with more chance of success. The hunt was rapidly coming to a close. 23. Jax got the comm call from Laurent just as he, I-5, and Den were leaving to rendezvous with Dija Duare. The Twi'lek was typically laconic. Someone wants you dead. How? Badly? No, I meant, how do you know this? And whoever it is, Jax added silently, tell him to get in line. Because I just finished dancing with the assassin who's looking for you. I could feel her more than a click away, which is why I went to investigate. Not the best idea I've had lately. Jax nodded. I take it that she's still ambulatory. And lethal. You're being hunted by the best, Jax, if that's any consolation. Where are you now? Sorry Street, near Caspac Boulevard. Wait for me there, Laurent said. As he listened to the Twi'lek elaborate on her adventure, Den realized once again that he was not a happy life form. Ara Singh? he asked. The Ara Singh? A grim-faced Laurent nodded slowly. Unless you know of another who matches the description. Her voice was as dry as a year on Tatooine. Flattering in a sense, I-5 said. I read up on her while I was uplinked to the police grid. She's infamous, and she doesn't come cheaply. Jax nodded. He knew that there was no need to wonder who would set a bounty hunter with Singh's reputation on him. Only one person could have afforded the credits to hire her. Nice to know I warrant the best, he thought wryly. Den grabbed his ears in a Celestin gesture of exasperation. I think, he said, that it's long past time for us to grab the next freighter to clear its cradle and leave, Jax. I mean, sweet Suki's aunt. He shook his head. If Sing's after you, she won't rest until most, if not all, of us are dead. And don't ask me to place odds. We have to get off this overpopulated pit of perversion. Not that I have anything in particular against perversion, mind you. It's just that I take umbrage when part of the perversity is trying to kill me. We gave our word to Deja Duare. You gave our word, Jax. Sure, her credit is generous and useful, but we can't spend it if we're dead. We need to relocate to a new neighborhood, on a new planet, in a new galaxy. Quiet, Laurent admonished them both. We have company. At the same time that she spoke, Jax heard the rising whine of repulsor lifts. A moment later, the first of three police skimmers settled down in the street beside them. Other pedestrians gave the cools a wide berth, and any civilian vehicles that had been in the vicinity suddenly found other venues more attractive. The police contingent was led by the sector prefect himself. Jax could see that he didn't look happy to see them. But then he doubted that Paul House ever looked happy to see anyone in his line of work. So, we meet again, he paused, singling out Jax and I-5. Just what are you two up to now? We're just out for an evening's entertainment, Jax said, and smiled. Right, the prefect responded. And why does the kind of entertainment you favor always seem to involve breaking the law? I see the Zeltron's not with you, he continued, without waiting for a reply. Interestingly, however, we just received a complaint from a local arcade describing two female humanoids who did a considerable amount of destruction there in the last hour. He looked appraisingly at Laurent, who met his gaze squarely. One of them, it seems, was a Twi'lek. 
I apologize for my species, she said. We can be rambunctious at times. There's also, House continued, a complaint on file from a well-respected art dealer named Shulfa, asserting that a certain Celestin, Dan did his best to shrink behind Jax's legs, claimed to be a police officer in an effort to extract information from said art dealer under pain of shutting down his business. A misunderstanding, a small voice said from the vicinity of the Jedi's thighs. Easily explained, I'm sure. No doubt, House murmured. Not so easy is the allegation from another broker, a lawn chair who calls himself Spa Fawn, that you two, he looked at Jax and Dan, entered his business premises under false pretenses, whereupon you intentionally and with malice threatened his person while delivering a merciless beating to one of his helpless and entirely innocent former employees, who, hold on, Jax interrupted. First of all, that lingerie broker is a professional thief. Second, the helpless and entirely innocent former employee was a subspecies of Cathar who probably massed a quarter metric tons of pure meanness and who threw the first punch. And third, never mind. The prefect sighed as he waved off Jax's indignation. I'm not really interested. But when your locator rings showed up near this latest disturbance, I figured it would be appropriate to check in. Just for old time's sake. His tone grew stern. I don't know exactly what's going on here, Pavan, beyond your amateur attempts to aid Femme Duare in her hope of identifying her partner's killer. But I do know that you're becoming an irritation. I have enough daily irritations in my position without having a semi-permanent one latch on to me. I say semi-permanent because it's not going to persist it's not going to persist, because if anything like this comes to my attention again, you, he pointed to Jax, and the rest of you as well, are going to find yourselves exploring the many and varied cultural delights of the sector jail. Do I make myself clear at every end of the spectrum? Perfectly, Jax assured him. The prefect scowled again and accompanied by his squad, moved off into the crowd. Den stepped tentatively out from behind Jax. Spafon, Paul House, and now the infamous Horus Singh. Whose list will we make next, Jax? Darth Vader's? The Celestin snapped his fingers in mock realization. Oh, wait, I forgot. We're already there. Silently, Jax regarded his friends. He was proud of them all proud of how they had come together as a team, proud of how they had handled every danger and problem that had been thrown at them since they'd been with him. Did he have the right to ask them to endure more, to chance possibly greater risks? What would Master Peel have done? Loranth would stay dirt side no matter what, he knew. The resistance movement was all she had to give her life meaning. But did he have the right to ask Den and I-5? as well as Renan, to put their lives on the line every day for him. He took a deep breath. All right. I'll have one more meeting with our client, and on the basis of that, we'll decide how to proceed. Maybe it is time to seek our fortunes elsewhere. Good call. Den was visibly relieved. Behind him, however... Lorant's continued silence bothered Jack slightly. But then he reminded himself she had been moodier than usual lately. He didn't need the force to tell him that. Mindful of his friend's concern, as well as his own interests, Jax was determined to be as firm and straightforward as possible in the course of what well might be his final meeting with Deja. It was a determination he set his mind to before he left for the meeting the following afternoon that he maintained in the course of the journey to her residence, and that he continued to hold right up until the time he was admitted to the domicile she had shared with the late Vess Follett, at which point determination vanished like a solar sail in a sun flare. 
Zeltrons were noted for the flamboyance of their attire, but what Deja was wearing when she greeted him seemed to be shocking even for her kind. A shimmering silver drapery, as much cloud as cloth, it clung to her body while remaining in constant and revealing motion. It was as if she had slipped into a pearlescent mist that coated the shore of a moonlit beach. It flowed in all directions, maintaining the shape of her body while giving fleeting, suggestive glimpses of it. A necklace and bracelet of matching Alderanian sequat shells completed the ensemble. Definitely not a knockoff she'd picked up at the local discount house. It had probably cost more than most folk made in a year. Or ten. Come in, please, Jax. Follow me. He did so, forcing himself into a detailed examination of the walls and ceiling, until they had arrived at the conversation chamber. It was a sunken, circular seating area, with a riverstone-surrounded fountain in the center that could spout water, fire, or any of a dozen other entertaining visual enhancements, according to the whim of the dwelling's occupants. At the moment, it was spraying a deep orange liquid. Off at the far end of the chamber were three, now nearly priceless, volettes, each dancing and contorting to its own individual encoding. They supplied all the illumination the chamber needed. The shifting light made it difficult for him to think. The cloud of intoxicating pheromones she was emitting, not to mention the intoxication factor of the cloud-like substance she was wearing, did nothing to improve his focus either. Using the techniques in which he had been trained, he regained his equilibrium. But even with the use of the force, it wasn't easy. She didn't make it any easier by sitting down right next to him. So, she began, what did you want to talk to me about, Jax? You said it was important. It is. Deja, could you possibly damp your, uh, emissions? She sat back from him, but only slightly. You could have put it a little more subtly, she said with a slight petulant move. Why? Do you find my personal emanations unpleasant? No, quite the contrary. That's the problem. I'm having a hard time focusing in such a potent atmosphere. Oh, well then, if it's unsettling you. She did nothing visually, but suddenly the room seemed to clear and he was able to think reasonably straight again without invoking the barrier of the force. Her smile left no doubt that being distracting bothered her not in the least. Thanks, he told her. It would have helped his concentration even more if she could have done something about what she was wearing, too, but asking her to eliminate that would in all likelihood only make things worse. I'm here because of the job. Her expression went from moo to full-fledged pout, which, although intended to convey a sense of disappointment, only ended up rendering her even more alluring. What's wrong, Jax? Isn't the retainer I'm paying you and your friends sufficient? If it's inadequate, I suppose I could... It's not the money, he assured her quickly. It's just that other factors have come into play. For one thing, the sector prefect is growing increasingly irritated at our probing, to the point of threatening us indirectly but unmistakably with incarceration if we persist in our inquiries. Her eyes flashed. Set against her pale red skin, the effect was positively destabilizing. Tell me his name. I'll pay him a visit. I guarantee you that afterward he won't threaten you again. Afterward, he'll probably run naked down the Imperial Parade thoroughfare if you ask him. An increasingly unsettled Jax thought. Better to stay away from the police. That's what we're trying to do. But there are other complications. For example, there's a woman. That truncated Twi'lek? She interrupted him. No, not Laurent. Why would she think of Laurent? He wondered. Someone else. Someone very dangerous. I'm concerned for the well-being of my friends. I could pay her a visit, too. Her suggestion helped Jax remember why he was here. This is one being I don't think even your persuasive abilities would affect. I'm afraid, Deja, that we're going to have to terminate the agreement between us. My friends and I will still do our best to get you safely off Coruscant. 
but under these new circumstances, for us to continue the search for your partner's killer simply poses too much of a danger, to you as well as us. Deja buried her face in her hands and started sobbing. A fresh flush of pheromones burst forth from her, different from those that had enveloped him earlier, but no less affecting. Despite the resistance he immediately put up, her empathic projections, combined with the desperate bouquet she was emitting, threatened to undermine his renewed resolve. He started to reach for her, to hold her and reassure her. Then, realizing what a mistake that would be, he remained where he was and let her weep. It broke his heart. After a couple of moments, she looked up, wiped at her eyes with the backs of her hands, and folded them in her lap. Even that simple gesture was fraught with sufficient implication to unnerve him, but he still didn't move. Isn't there anything I can do to make you change your mind, Jax? If not more money, then what? The promise that shone in her eyes and hung expectantly in the air between them was almost powerful enough to shift a small planetary body in its orbit. He felt himself wavering. Stall, blast it. It's just that, he began, playing for time to get a new grip on his emotions. We don't seem to be making any progress, or at least not the right kind of progress. We've learned a few things, but they've just sent us off on different tangents. What we need is a fresh start, a new angle. Is there anything you can tell us that you haven't told us before, that you haven't told the police? Well, she said, I have been doing a little questioning of my own. This is a pretty exclusive residential area, and people of all species here tend not to want anything to do with established authority. But they'll unburden themselves to me. A Celestin rock render would unburden itself to you, Jax thought. So what have you found out? Probably nothing. But there's an old drawl who lives several domiciles down from here. You know the drawl? They're so absorbed in their libraries that they hardly ever socialize. Because of that, I don't know if the police ever interviewed this elder. But the drawl are also noted for their jewelry work. And she used to sometimes have a chat with Vess about how art crosses species lines. She dropped by just a couple of days ago to finally offer her condolences. Said she would have done so sooner, but that she was occupied with some important bit of cataloging. I invited her in and brewed up some Dianogan tea she had brought. Deja smiled coquettishly. Well, you know what that stuff can do. We had a good time. The Zeltron leaned toward Jax, and this time her pheromonic discharge was rigorously muted. In the course of our conversation, she let slip that she had seen a large Vendalian in the neighborhood a few nights before Vess's death. Jax frowned. It might be sheer coincidence that a Vendalian was seen in the vicinity when Vallette had been slain. After all, it wasn't as if the Baron and his mate were the only two Vendalians on Coruscant, or even residing in the better regions of the Imperial Sector. But what if it wasn't a coincidence? What if there was some kind of a tie there? As he pondered it, there came the muted chime that indicated a presence at the entry. Grateful for the interruption, Jack sent tendrils of the Force to investigate. What he encountered was cause at first for surprise, then unease. The entity requesting an audience was none other than Seely, Spa Fon's Cathar bodyguard, or former bodyguard, before Jax had shamed him by defeat. He and Dan had left the huge felinoid creature back at Spa Fon's, where, he'd assumed, the warrior had expiated his shame through the ritual of Gian Kuri. Instead, here he was. How had he found Jax? Was he seeking a rematch? Jax sighed and loosened the flame sword in its sheath. Wait here, he told Deja. Then he stepped outside to confront the giant once again realizing with grim irony that in some ways a death match against a being twice his size was preferable to being alone with Deja and her pheromones. Before he could say anything, however, the Cathar gave a low, submissive growl. If it may please my conqueror, he said with bowed head, 
I have overheard certain scraps of gossip and hearsay on the streets that might have bearing on your quest. He paused, waiting for permission to continue. Go on. An acquaintance of mine, a Garoon, has a droid that he sometimes hires out as domestic help to members of off-world gentility. This droid told him that he saw a skimmer wearing the seal of Umber House parked near the conapt of the artist Vess Volette on the night of his death. The imposing creature lowered his eyes. I pray that this information may be of some small use to you. It is indeed, Jack said. In fact, it buys you manumission. I return to you your autonomy. Go in peace. Seely raised his eyes in surprise and gratitude and lost no time in making himself scarce. Jax returned to Deja's sitting room, where the Zeltron eyed him inquisitively. Who was that? I think, Jack said, it may have been the answer we've been looking for. 24. It had taken time, but his instincts and his searching, all his hard work, had finally paid off. Where better to look for a renegade Jedi, after all, than at a gathering of renegades? Yet when the several meetings he had attended had resulted in nothing, not even a lead, Typho had been about to give up and focus on his other lines of inquiry. And then, at the last gathering he had decided to attend, Success. Perseverance was ever the key to victory. Of course, the young man could be another Jax Pavan with the same name, and not the Jedi whom Aura Singh had been charged with finding for Darth Vader. But given that Typho had found him at a whiplash meeting, he found the possibility dubious, to say the least. As he trailed the young man from a distance, the captain utilized all the skills he had mastered in the security forces to conceal his presence from his quarry. Mentally, he fought to keep his attention on anything and everything else. The drifting aroma of cooking food, the passing of an attractive humanoid, an argument, an offer, a whisper overheard. If the fellow preceding him through the crowds was indeed a Jedi, Typho knew he had to exert every possible effort to keep from creating a disturbance in the Force that might alert Pavan to being followed. At least his quarry didn't turn and look behind him as he made his way confidently through the biodiverse throng. Perhaps the glut of various emotional emanations from the crowd prevented him from singling out his tracker. Or, perhaps, feeling safe in familiar surroundings, he simply wasn't paying attention. The reasons didn't especially interest the captain, as long as the latter's anonymity was maintained. Eventually, he saw Pavan enter a block of residences in a cul-de-sac. While automated residential security prevented Typho from following the object of his attention inside, still, he was confident he now knew the location of the man's domicile. It was enough for his purposes. A dozen individual dwellings might lie behind the single secure entrance, or a hundred. It didn't matter. It was enough that he had tracked the Jedi to this locality because even if events proceeded as he planned, and Vader was unable to snare his thoughts with the Force, Typho still wanted an ace in his field. He felt no compunction about giving up Pavan's location, if by doing so he kept the upper hand for a few moments longer. Luck favored the prepared. Every soldier knew that. And besides, he planned on sending the young Jedi a gift, that if things didn't go well, would at least see Pavan somewhat more prepared to face a Sith Lord. It was tempting to give in to the irony inherent in using it himself, but he knew he had to maximize his chances of success. Vader wanted the renegade Jedi Jax Pavan, so much so that he had sent the infamous bounty hunter Aura Singh after him. Too bad then for Aura Singh, because Typho had found him first. He smiled grimly. How could an unknown minor planetary official possibly gain an audience with the Emperor's wrist talk? By offering him something he desperately wanted. Unbeknownst to him, Jax Pavan 
was Typho's ticket to a meeting with the Dark Lord. The last meeting Vader would ever take. There were ways of arranging such things, ways of making contact, even with the Emperor himself, if one knew how to work the proper bureaucratic channels. Typho's status helped, of course. It was not as if the peculiar roundabout communique was coming from some adult citizen off the street, with an exaggerated sense of his own importance. As Typho tracked it, he saw that his message was making steady progress toward its designated recipient. He had little doubt what the reaction would be when it got there. Vader would contact him directly. He wouldn't go through an intermediary for something that was evidently important enough to hire a bounty hunter of Singh's caliber. And Typho would respond, of course, but not without taking proper precautions. It was said that the Dark Lord could read Ascension's true intentions at a great distance. That might be nothing but Bilter Scoot, but as a security professional, the captain would take no chances. Thus his preparations, in addition to ascertaining Pavan's whereabouts, including paying a visit to a certain apothecary with a less than salutary reputation. Between the two, he should be ready. The place was located on a dark street in an especially poorly lit section of under level 20. This was not because it was a particularly bad neighborhood, quite the contrary, actually. It was simply that the non-humans who inhabited the area tended to be members of species who preferred dim light. Even so, the Kubaz still wore the diffusion goggles favored by her people when dwelling on planets with brighter suns than that of their homeworld. The black bristles on her head twitched, and her long snout flexed upward in the equivalent of an unctuous smile as she greeted the new customer with a flourish of hand gestures. Cursed! How I bees of service, sir! Beneath the barely adequate overhead light, the chemist's green-black skin appeared almost devoid of color. I want to buy a Tauzin skin nodule. Delicate fingers were already tracing relevant notations in the hollow proj that hung in the air between them. Does a rare curiosity, expensive? Cost doesn't matter, Typho said. Do you have one? Mm, as possibly. Drawing images and symbols in the air, the Kubaz checked her inventory. Got one in a stock. She calculated the cost. It gonna be... Mftsa... Nine hundred creds total. Expensive indeed, Typho thought, then shrugged. There was no help for it. The Tauzin, also known as a force dragon, was an extremely rare giant transparent invertebrate native to the jungle moon of Vark. Some were also rumored to live in the abyssal caverns far beneath the lowest subsurface levels of Coruscant. What made the creature of interest to Typho was its invisibility to force sensitives. According to legend, the spherical excrescences from the creature's skin produced a strange void in the sensorium granted to some by the force. So it was said, at any rate. The captain hoped the legend was true. He would only have one chance to test its efficacy. The Kubaz handed him a transparent envelope that contained a sphere about the size of his fist, colored the faint yellow shade of a ranker's tusk. The captain regarded it for a moment. Strange indeed to think of so small a talisman laying low the great Lord Vader. But that was the special thing about talismans, wasn't it? They always promised more than they appeared capable of delivering. That was, after all, how magic worked. Typho turned and strode from the building, his talisman held tightly in his hand. He had one final chore, the package for Jack's Pavan. After that, he would be ready. 25. The silver-coated protocol droid could not look surprised, but its reaction to their presence was conveyed through its voice. Citizen Pavan. Peering past Jax, the mechanical noted those assembled behind him. And your friends, the droid's gaze stopped on a more familiar figure. Dijadware, you are, as always, most welcome in this household. 
Dan took a step forward. How about the rest of us? The droid appeared momentarily confused. You did not announce your coming. It's not in my file. The Baron and his mate are in, Jax asked. They are in residence, yes? Glistening lenses regarded the Jedi. May I assume that your appearance here, concurrently with that of Prefect House, is not a coincidence? You could assume that, Dan said, since we arranged to meet him here. Please announce us, Jack said. The droid hesitated, then turned and shuffled away through the plush carpeting. Jax and his companions waited outside the formal entry. The mechanical was not gone long. Please come in. The Baron is anxious as ever to hear what you have to say. And as always, I am sure he will be delighted that Deja is with you. The Baron isn't the only curious one. Paul House stepped into view in the foyer. I can't wait to learn your reasons for dragging me over here at this hour. Once again, they were impressed by the opulence of the Baron's surroundings. Umber greeted them convivially this time. His mate appeared shortly thereafter. Paul House, who was there with a the droid assistant, glowered at them. Let's hear it, the Zabrak growled. Jax nodded. Dan and I-5 moved to opposite corners of the room. Their attitude was unperturbed, but their senses were alert. Everyone knew what Jax was going to say, even Deja. They had discussed it beforehand, and all were agreed. Now that the moment had come, Jax let the threads of the Force spread outward from him to encompass everyone in the room. His effort to provide interior confirmation for what he was about to announce was disappointing, but then he'd expected it to be. Very well, he replied in response to the prefect. I know who murdered Ves Vallette. He stole a quick glance at the Zeltron standing nearby. Having been prepared for the disclosure, she showed no reaction, either hormonally or telepathically. Satisfied, he returned his attention to their hosts and the police. A Vindalian skimmer bearing the crest of Umber was seen near the artist's studio on the night he was killed. As a startled baron opened his mouth, Jax raised a hand to forestall the objection he sensed was coming. I know it wasn't you, baron. I am as certain of that as I can be. You've been checked out, and there's nothing to suggest you had any involvement in the murder. Quite the contrary. My investigations indicate the same, if anyone's interested, House added dryly. Umber settled himself. I don't know whether to be offended or relieved by your words, Pavan. You are a true aficionado of Vallette's art. There are ways of confirming these things. You love his work, and you were clearly very fond of him. We both were, Umber declared. Jax sensed the force threads he had let flow drift back to him. Yes, there was definitely a sense of unease in the room, of rising disquiet. It only served to substantiate what he had come to suspect. Yes, but certainly you far more than your mate. Lifting his gaze, he looked past the noble. Isn't that right, Baroness Umber? She looked straight at him. Unfamiliar as he was with her kind, he could not read her expressions properly. But there was no mistaking the anger that flowed through the Force. I would not deny it. Our droid, and Jax indicated the watching I-5, succeeded in gaining access to your banking records. He glanced at House. The Zabrak said nothing, but he was watching Jax very closely. Really, Pavan, this is too much. This time Umber was unable to keep his outrage under control. Jax met his irate gaze without flinching. Over the past three standard years, you spent a considerable sum on the works of Ves Vallette. So much, in fact, that your credit rating and ability to spend and borrow became impaired. Umber could only sputter indignation. I had it under control at all times. Aside from the affront to my privacy, I fail to see how this has any bearing whatsoever on the identity of Volette Slayer. He turned toward House. Prefect, surely this is a contravention of some investigative procedure? 
House shook his horned head slowly. Let's see where he's going with it. Someone else was worried about your finances as well, Baron, Jax continued. Someone who apparently felt otherwise about how well you had them under control. Someone who was not quite as overcome by the Kamasi's creations as you were. Again, Jax shifted his attention to the Baron's mate. There was no question now about the uneasiness and anger that were flowing through the force. He pressed on. You were the one Deja's neighborhood acquaintance saw near Vallette's studio that night, Kirma Umber. The witness said the individual she saw was larger than most Vindalians. I still don't know much about your species, but I know that the female is always larger than the male. You followed your mate because you feared he was about to purchase yet another of Vallette's works, thereby further damaging your fiscal standing. After the Baron left, you confronted Vallette and threatened him probably ordered him not to sell to the Baron any longer, or at least until you could get the family finances restabilized. She was staring at him. Many humans have vivid imaginations. I have to say that Georges Pavan is far more florid than most. Her tone was calm. But what he sensed from her was quite different. Independent voice and artist that he was, Vallette refused. You attacked him? maybe not with the intent of killing him, but with enough force to stab him. Then you fled. Baron Umber was staring at his mate. It was plain that he wanted to say something, but could not find the words. Kirma looked at him, then back at Jax. You know something. I don't know how, but... Yes, I followed my mate, and I confronted Vest. I did ask him to stop selling his work to us, but it had nothing to do with finances. When the Baron says that he has them under control, I know that to be true. He loves Volet's work, but he would never risk the family's financial stability in pursuit of anyone's art. Such a thing would be positively unvindalian. Then why? You should know. Taking a step forward, the Vendalian female raised an arm and pointed. It was because of her. Unbidden, the attention of everyone in the room shifted immediately to the startled Zeltron. Deja gaped at the Vendalian, looked at the Baron, turned back to the Jedi. Jax, I... I don't know what she's talking about. Umber spoke up without having to be prompted. There was an attraction between us, I admit. He turned to his mate. But that was all. Nothing happened. Kirma, I had no control over my reactions when I was in Volette's dwelling and she was present. He gestured helplessly. She's a Zeltron. Better you had stayed clear of her presence, his mate murmured. How could I do that? He protested. She was always there. When I was choosing a sculpture, she was there. When Vess and I were discussing payment, she was there. When negotiations were concluded or art was discussed, she was there. She was his partner. Kirma Umber looked past her mate. Her emotions were now very different from those Jacks had perceived earlier. And she is a Zeltron. That explains, but does not excuse. Nothing happened, Umber reiterated, with as much force as he could muster without shouting. His earnestness spread through the force, and Jax believed him. His mate met his gaze, held it, and finally turned to the Jedi. I confronted Vesvolet. I left in a fury, but I left him alive. She turned back to Jax. You must believe me. I didn't kill him. A voice, not yet heard from, finally made itself known. It was calm, controlled, methodical. It was also from the last entity the Umbers and House were expecting to hear from. I did. 26. Typho's hands did not tremble as he entered the electronic address. There was silence after he finished, save for the faint susurrus of static. 
He imagined an aide, speaking deferentially to the Emperor's second-in-command. Lord Vader, the communication you requested be brought immediately to your notice, is retained for your attention on Channel 6. Or words to that effect. Typho wondered what sort of humor his attempt to contact Vader had left the Dark Lord in. His mind's eye saw Vader alone in a dark chamber, surrounded by humming, flashing technology. No doubt far more comfortable in such environs than in the presence of servile organics. His aides were in all likelihood unable to keep from engaging in the most obvious sort of fawning and scraping, in the hope of incurring some small smidgen of their master's favor. Annoying as such types were, they were sometimes necessary. Vader couldn't do everything by himself, couldn't be everywhere at once, and seeing to the organization and consolidation of the Empire, no doubt demanded every moment of his conscious hours. Except for this one interruption. For something like this, he would make time. The hollow proj flickered and took shape. Typho watched as the three-dimensional image of the Dark Lord swiveled around in a massive blue-black control chair and thoughtfully regarded him. From Vader's point of view, Typho was merely a human male with his face masked. Though he felt nothing, he knew that the Dark Lord was reaching out with the Force, trying to divine the entity behind the disguise. He could imagine Vader's frustration as the latter found his attempt mysteriously blocked. He was betting everything on the Tao Zin's skin node working now. If Vader was being stymied in his attempts to read him, the Dark Lord gave no sign of it. You know who I am, he said. Who are you who begs my attention? My name is for my family, Typho replied. I have something you want. Vader nodded, the heavy helmet bobbing slightly. So you claim. Whether you speak the truth remains to be seen. Then see and believe. The projection wavered slightly, as a smaller image was superimposed within the first. It showed the end of some meeting that had just broken up, clearly recorded from a cloaked pickup. The assembly and its purpose would not concern the Dark Lord. What would catch his attention, Typho knew, was the figure of a young man coming toward the pickup's viewpoint. Automatically adjusting for distance, the device kept the human in focus and proper dimensions. There was no question of the identity. The image's voice, with that of the pickup's owner carefully and professionally deleted, provided what further confirmation was needed. Ah. Satisfied, Vader relaxed in his command chair. The traitorous Jedi, Jax Pavan. You want him. I can give him to you. And in return, Vader sounded impatient. Whole worlds waited, no doubt, on his decisions. Nothing much. Five million Imperial credits. You are bold, Vader said, a note of amusement in his deep voice. Resourceful as well in your attempt to hide your mind from the Force. I find myself intrigued. The credits will be transferred according to whatever directives you provide. I will authorize payment to take place the instant the renegade Jedi is in my hands. Vader didn't stoop to haggling, Typho noted with relief. Still, the game had to be played out to avoid arousing the Sith's suspicions. How do I know I can trust you, Lord Vader? Vader seemed not in the least affronted. You do not, and no guarantees I might make would reassure you. But money means nothing to me. I only want Pavan. Then you shall have him. Tonight at first darkness. There is a condemned transport hangar in Sector 4G2. Come alone to the sixth floor. A dozen stormtroopers or so might make me nervous and put a premature end to our transaction. I need no escort. I'll be there. And remember, I want him alive. No worries, Typho said. I've gained his trust, and when his guard is down, I'll spike his drink with a double dose of dream dust. By the time we three rendezvous tonight, he'll be so happily deranged, you could tell him you were his long-lost Jedi master and he'd believe it. A good plan. Without another word, 
Vader severed the link. The image imploded and vanished. So, then, the meeting was set. Darth Vader, the conscienceless murderer whom he had come to Coruscant to confront, would be there in person at the designated location. It won't be long now, Padme, he murmured. I did, the mild voice said. All eyes turned to the voice's source, the Umber family protocol droid. The Baron and Baroness stared in shock at the domestic mechanical, who looked calmly back. Yes, you did, Jack said. Through the force, he read surprise and curiosity from House. He looked at the stunned Vindalians. I'm sorry, Baroness, to have accused you unfairly. It was the only way to induce your droid to confess. But how? Why? Umber asked. Your droid has been in the service of the same family for a very long time, Jack said. Much of the time we organics don't even notice droids. We've developed the ability to ignore their presence, even in intimate situations. He smiled slightly. I speak from experience. We know they're there, but we don't acknowledge them unless and until we need them. Yet that doesn't mean they're devoid of self-motivation. He glanced at I-5. Take I-5, for example. But he's an exception, Den pointed out. Your social and interactive programming and related circuitry were illegally modified, he added to the droid. I-5 looked down at his friend. So, naturally, you would assume that I'm the only one who can be or has been so modified? Across the room, Kirma Umber was moving slowly away from her droid, away from the machine that had been in the service of the family Umber for longer than she could remember. It's not possible, she said. There was no reason. I saw your distress. The silver protocol droid spoke calmly. I perceived it silently for years, while the Baron paid his frequent visits to the artist Volette and his partner the Zeltron di Giatoire. I stood in silence, not commenting, while you shouted aloud your fears and worries in the privacy of your chamber. The last night you went to see Volette, I followed. Security is, after all, part of my programming. I saw no need to concern you with my presence. I observed your argument with the artist. I registered your body language, the raw emotion of your tone, the heightened conductivity of your galvanic skin response. I determined then that the way to best fulfill my programming and my obligation to the family umber. I confronted the Kamasi and attempted to carry out this programming with words. I was ignored, of course. I decided at that moment that further action was required on behalf of my owner. I therefore stabbed Vesfolette in the anterior plex with this. The droid held up his right fist, and one of the digits shot up, transforming into a short, lethal-looking spike. Kerma Umber gasped. Your data retrieval spike, Jax murmured. You had more than enough strength to penetrate the protective cartilage. True. As there were no direct witnesses, once the Baron was cleared of involvement, I thought the matter, deplorable as it was, might fade away. His gaze was focused across the room, on Jax and I-5. I feel something that organics would term curiosity, a desire for heuristic extrapolation. How did you come to suspect me? I-5 answered. While Jax and Den were questioning Sparfon, House coughed discreetly, to which Dan offered a sickly smile. I was engaged in a cyberspatial data search. He looked at Jax. If you will recall, I was still in the same mode when you returned. I was studying the details of the murder. In the course of my investigation, I made good use of access to certain records of the sector police. Dan gawked at his companion, then looked at House. And you thought what I did was illegal? When I was at the crime scene, Jax continued. I noticed that many of the forensics droids were DN-724s, which I-5's research indicated are quite similar to your design. He looked at the protocol droid, which stared calmly back. They had a tendency to shuffle across the plush carpeting, leaving distinctive tracks, the same sort of tracks you leave in this carpet. That was what first aroused my suspicions. 
Further investigation by I-5 revealed that your model had a data spike, perfectly suited for inflicting the wound that killed Valette. He didn't mention the biggest clue of all, which was, ironically, the lack of a clue. His inability to sense the guilty party, put together with his negative readings of the umbers, pointed straight at their droid. Mechanicals were notoriously hard to read through the Force. He couldn't tell House this, of course. The Baron started to speak. If it was our droid, then a reprogramming should suffice to... The droid, astoundingly, cut his owner off. Such an action would bring shame to the family. I am prepared to execute the appropriate resolution. It is only rational. The gleaming lenses dimmed visibly. A few flickers of light sparked from the base of the droid's skull. As the smell of ozone began to contaminate the room and the last of the sparks flared out, I-5 walked between the organics, stopping when he was within arm's reach of the motionless silver mechanical. As the others looked on, he extended his left hand. From the next to last digit, a small probe telescoped, which I-5 inserted into a receptacle in the side of the other droid. A moment later, it withdrew and retracted back into his finger. I-5 turned to the watching organics. Wiped. The neural net was fried. Not restorable by any specialist, no matter how talented. He tapped the side of the protocol droid. Probably worth something as scrap. Jax, who was watching Deja saw a single tear roll down her cheek. Well, that's just great, Paul House said. What am I supposed to tell the upper crust who've been clamoring for some closure regarding their favorite artist, that a droid killed him? Oh, yeah, that'll go down well. If I might make a suggestion. Deja said. Surely there is no dearth of criminals on the streets who have gone free for want of evidence. I would think that this crime could be adjusted to fit one of them. She noticed the others looking at her in surprise, and shrugged. As Prefect House has pointed out, there is no sense of justice to Vess's death as it stands. If some good can come out of it, maybe that will help. House ruminated for a moment, then turned to his droid assistant. Round up the usual species, he told it. Maybe we can get something good out of this, after all. Kerma Umber stared at the permanently frozen mechanical, then met her husband's gaze. The Baron smiled reassuringly at his mate. We'll get another one. It was only a device and it was getting old. Yes, she murmured. It was only a device. A tear coursed down her cheek. But loyal. 27. The jet-black air car had no driver, only its singular passenger. Typho watched from his concealment. Apparently Vader had acceded to his conditions. Well and good. The armored, automated vehicle arrived on exactly the indicated level and stopped at precisely the specified spot within the condemned transport hangar at one minute past the designated time for the meeting. A stickler for precision, Vader was. Typho tensed. He knew he had but one shot at this. He had no illusions about his contemplated action. It had nothing to do with honor, with a fair fight. It was murder pure and simple. He would have to strike from behind, swiftly and lethally, and from a distance, with a blaster. It was murder, and murder for the most ignoble of motives. Revenge. He shrugged away the thought. He had come to terms months before with what he was doing, and why. His soul might be irredeemably stained by his action tonight, but Padme's would find peace. That was all that mattered. I came as you specified. Spreading his arms wide, Vader lifted his cloak. Darkness seemed to envelop the entire floor of the hangar. Alone and unarmed. 
It was time to trust in the small clump of mummified skin cells resting in his pocket. Time to avenge the woman he'd loved. Time to strike. Typho stepped quickly from his place of concealment on the floor above Vader. He'd chosen the spot with care. Directly before him was a hole six meters wide, and framed squarely within it was the Dark Lord's back. Captain Typho raised his blaster and fired. At first he thought the ionized gas cartridge in his blaster had backfired. It was as if a giant invisible hand had snatched him up and hurled him with bone-breaking force against the far wall. Stunned, in shock, he watched Vader's form levitate through the hole in the floor. The black boots touched down next to Typho's broken body. How pathetic, the Dark Lord commented. He stood towering over his adversary. Did you really think you had the faintest hope of assassinating me? It's been tried, by far better than you. Typho coughed, feeling his insides grinding together like broken glass. Blood stained his shirt. You lied, he said, feeling the words lodge like stones in his throat. Did I? I told you I would come unarmed, and here I am, Vader told him. You mistake the dark side for a weapon, something extraneous. It isn't. It is intrinsic. I could no more shed it than I could go about without my support suit. He stepped closer. I will give you one more chance, he rumbled, to cease whatever game you're playing and provide me with Pavan's location. Or what? Typho spat a mouthful of bright red blood. You've already killed me. True, you will not last long in any event. But don't underestimate the power of the dark side. It can ease your passage. There is still a little time, unless you squander it. Vader stepped closer, bent to peer into Typho's face. Why have you made this foolish attempt on my life? The deep synthesized voice echoed through the empty hangar level. Not that a specific reason is required or expected, but I should like to know. Those who speak their last should speak something of value. He leaned closer at Typho's beckoning to hear his final words. Typho was fading fast. He concentrated every fiber of his being on remaining conscious for one final act. This is for Padme, he rasped and with a supreme effort he spat a mouthful of blood directly into the surprised Dark Lord's mask. Vader's reaction was not what he'd expected. After a frozen instant, ignoring the bloody spittle running down one plasteel cheek, he knelt and grabbed Typho by the hair, lifting the latter's head and eliciting a cry of renewed pain from him. What? The flare and the force that raced through the hangar was enough to shake the foundations of the building. The Dark Lord actually seemed to grow, to expand, and become more terrible in his rage than Typho would have believed possible. Padme, Typho mumbled. Padme Amidala, the woman I loved from afar for years. He coughed again, felt more red, shearing in his chest. She never knew. She was too busy, too deeply engaged in the Service of her people to notice me. Another bright scarlet flower bloomed from his mouth. And I attended to my duty. I, Typho, captain of Naboo. But I loved her. And now, now she's dead. Dead. Then with an extraordinary rush of resolve, Typho managed to raise himself slightly, exerting himself through sheer force of will against Vader's anger. You killed her, Vader. You. I know it. Vader was silent and motionless again. When he spoke, his voice had the same deep inflection, the same synthesized thunder, and yet was somehow different. You know nothing. Vader straightened, letting Typho's head fall. You're not worthy of uttering her name raising his arm. He flexed his fingers at the helpless Typho. 
The captain's mouth opened, and his eyes bulged slightly as the flow of air to his lungs was constricted. Far down in his mind, a remote part of him commented dispassionately that this was no doubt how his beloved had met her end. Astonishingly, he found he still was able to choke out a final sentence. And you're responsible for the death of the Jedi, Anakin Skywalker as well. The invisible, inexorable grip on Typho's throat momentarily relaxed as Vader drew back in slight surprise. That brief pause was followed by the horrible sound of a Sith Lord laughing. Three levels below, a pair of intoxicated humanoids heard just the echo of it and were immediately shocked into sobriety, the fearful clear-headedness that comes with realizing that untold terror lurks nearby. When Vader extended his arm downward the second time, his control was more precise, more deliberate. Yes, the Dark Lord said, his tone one of grim amusement. Yes, I killed Anakin Skywalker. I watched him die. He was weak, was Skywalker. In the end, he could not rule himself, could not control his contemptible human emotions. Most of all, he did not understand or appreciate the true strength of the dark side. And so, he died. The galaxy is better off without him. The world was unraveling fast for Typho. The pain was going, finally, pouring out of him as fast as his blood. But he died with a smile on his face. For although he did not understand the how or the why of it, he knew that dying with Padme's name on his lips was a finer and deeper revenge upon Darth Vader than he possibly could have hoped for through confrontation. It was as if he could feel the man's heart and know that somehow he had ripped it open with her name alone. He also knew that living was a far worse fate for Vader than death. He was content. Now he could go and find Padme. 28. The package came by courier, just as Jax, I-5, Laurent, and Dan were leaving Poloda Place to rendezvous with Deja and escort her to her ship. The whiplash, aided by the Cephalon's prognosticative powers, had at last succeeded in securing a berth for her aboard the Green Asteroid, a trader in the Polisotechnic League. It would take her, over the next several months, and by a roundabout route, to the pleasure planet of Zeltros. Dija Duare was going home. Renan had, as usual, elected to stay behind, citing, Unfinished Research. Jax accepted the package, which was about thirty centimeters by two, from the delivery droid. There was no return address. He looked at his friends, who appeared just as baffled as he. He shrugged and started to open it. Dan backed hastily away. Are you sure that's a good idea? I don't sense anything negative or dangerous about it. Actually, that wasn't entirely true. The enigmatic parcel had definite vibes though nothing about them indicated imminent danger. Instead, it seemed steeped in evil, marinated in blood. Whatever it was, death had not been far from it. When he opened the package, he understood why. It was a lightsaber. A hollow card projected a message inscribed in simple cursive. A Jedi should not have to rely on an inferior weapon. Good luck. It was signed, A Fellow Revolutionary. Jax examined the weapon. The hilt's design was elegantly simple, consisting of an ambidextrous grip of molded silver duralumin with a locking activator similar to the one he'd lost in the factory district. Good, he thought wryly, because you never know when you'll have to overload another nuclear reactor. He wondered what color the blade was. There was no way to know without activating it, which, given their location on a public street, seemed a trifle rash. He knew it was functional, however. He could feel the force coiled within it. Dan, standing on tiptoe, was able to read the missive. Well, he said, that's serendipitous. Weren't you just trying to build one of these? 
I-5 took the card and looked at it. A standard one-time holoprog chip, he said. Nothing remarkable about either the writing style or the delivery mechanism. He cocked a photoreceptor at the Jedi. I assume this comes as unexpected largesse. You might say that. I can't imagine who could have... Jack stopped abruptly, remembering the man he'd met yesterday at the whiplash assembly. What had his name been? Typhon? About all Jack's recalled of the man was that he'd sported an eye patch. Could this have come from him? He'd shown interest in the Velmorian weapon, after all. I met a man yesterday, he said slowly, who might be. He stopped abruptly, struck momentarily silent by a sudden turmoil in the force. Its origin was a psyche he'd encountered before, of that he was certain, even though he'd only experienced it indirectly. No Jedi, no one, in fact, with more than a smattering of midichlorians, could forget the impact of a will that strong. Jack said, Vader's nearby. Den looked nervously around the crowded street, craning his neck in a futile attempt to see better. Where? Nearby is a relative term, Laurent said, but I'd put the probability of his being in a ten-square-kilometer radius at pretty high. She gestured south. In that direction. Okay, Den said. So we'll be going that way, right? He pointed north. Jax and Loranth both stood quite still. Then Jax said, He's pretty upset, not bothering to cloak his feelings at all. Intriguing, Loranth said. Not a word we want to be using right now, Den said. Shouldn't we be pulling in our antennae, looking for a metaphorical rock to crawl under, or maybe even a real rock, instead of standing around here sticking out like a bunch of naked Jawas? Don't worry, Jax said. We're not pushing and he's far too troubled to be aware of us. He hesitated, then added, It does make me wonder what could disturb the Dark Lord to such a degree. Fine, Den said. Wonder while we wander north. With Volette's murderer finally identified, and conveniently self-immolated, Den was looking forward to events taking a more leisurely pace, for a time at least. One very large pressure had already been lifted from them for the foreseeable future. Deja had insisted on continuing their stipend indefinitely. I insist, she'd told Jax, forestalling any protests he had been about to make. You've set my mind easy insofar as Vess's murder is concerned. He has left me more credits than I know how to spend, and coming from his Eltron, that's saying something. It would be my honor to subsidize you and the work you do. Jax typically had done his best to talk her out of the deal, but Deja, bless her, had been adamantine. And when faced with the persuasive power of her biochemical and telepathic arsenal, his resistance, he'd admitted, had been pretty pathetic. So she had gone back to her conapt to pack before meeting them at the local spaceport, and Jax had gone back to the others with a bemused look on his face. Thus they had creds in a shed, as the Ugnaughts put it, for the foreseeable future, and they had more than enough work to keep them occupied between the UML and the investigations that Jax would no doubt keep getting them involved in. Den sighed. The chances of Vader locating Jax and bringing his booted heel down upon them all were still much higher than the Celestin would have liked, which meant spacing as soon as possible was still the only sensible option. But he'd come reluctantly to realize that, for all their boasting of rationality, Humans were most comfortable living in the Nexus den. Actually, he thought, make that the Nexus mouth. He'd come to terms with the lifestyle, mostly at least. And it wasn't like they didn't have some firepower on their side. I-5 and Loranth were still spot on deadly with their lasers and blasters. And Renan, he had to admit, could slice past any database, imperial or otherwise, and leave not a single ion to trace slicker than supercooled Tibana condensate. Maybe he wasn't the most convivial of comrades, but Den could overlook that. And then there was Jax. The Jedi was, he had to admit, growing into his role of a hero rather well. 
if he continued to survive Vader's intermittent attention, not to mention the thousand and one other dangers that loomed down level every day and night. He just might become a force, no pun intended, to reckon with. He had a good enough support group, although there did seem to be subtle changes in the overall group dynamic over the past couple of days between him and the others, particularly as far as Laranth was concerned, though the Jedi was as blind as a space slug if he couldn't see how the Twi'lek felt about him. But there was a certain amount of tension between him and I-5 that was new as well. What was up with that, Den wondered. Hard to tell if anything was different as far as Renan was concerned. The Dur Elemen kept interactions between himself and the others at a minimum. And of late he'd become even more immersed in the hollow net than usual. Den shrugged. Well, after all, what family didn't have its bickerings and quarrels? It was important to remember that, because that was what they were, a family, albeit a pretty dysfunctional one at times. The important thing was that they all came together when needed to make a good team. Jax watched their client approach the spaceport's entrance, noting with relief that she'd changed into traveling wear that was far less riot inciting than last night's attire. As she drew closer, he realized that she damped her pheromones and mental lures as well. Good. Now let's get her on board and off planet before anything else can go wrong. He felt slightly ashamed of his attitude, but only slightly. Though he had grown fond of Deja, he was more than happy that she was moving on. Frankly put, she was trouble, even without the chemical and psychic come-ons. Spaceport 9 was a large mass of surging, pushing, irritated, hurrying, frantic beings, representing every species that was used to traveling between the stars, which was to say that it was no different in design from any of the other many large spaceports on the capital world. What made navigating 9 a little more confusing, a little more difficult, and considerably more frustrating than working one's way through, say, Spaceport 8 or 10, however, was the fact that 9 was undergoing a complete makeover under the supervision of the Imperial Spaceport Authority. Old structures were being demolished, new ones erected, traffic rerouted, and what was left still had to function somehow as a fully operational port. In such circumstances, the needs of machines invariably took precedence over those of organics. Station, crew, and maintenance workers, not to mention travelers, all found themselves squeezed into smaller and smaller corridors and forced to take directions from programs or service droids that were themselves subject to minute-by-minute -minute updating. It all made finding one's destination an exercise akin to negotiating the lowermost underlevels of the city itself. Surrounded and delayed by agitated panglossia in dozens of tongues, the unavoidable reek of too close packed bodies and the overriding cacophony of non-stop construction, one determined small group continued to force its way toward one of the farther launch pods. I-5 used a directed hypersonic pulse to ensure that his words would be heard over the din of the crowd. Turn down the corridor to the left, the droid said. It's a temporary elevated access way that will let us bypass much of the major construction. Jax noticed glowing letters floating above the entrance, along with a multilingual glyph for danger. It says, Construction Personnel Only, he said. That's us, responded the droid. We're constructing a faster way to our destination. Jax hesitated, but only until they entered the corridor. It was nearly deserted, and for the first time since arriving at the port, they could actually advance unimpeded. Jax took a deep breath and relaxed. Or rather, he tried to. Now that they had temporarily bypassed the pandemonium, he realized that the Force was trying to tell him something. Actually, that was much too mild a phrase. It was more like being grabbed by the lapels and shaken violently. Before he realized it, the hilt of his newly acquired lightsaber was in his hand. He didn't ignite it yet, however. They were still in an all-too-public place. A quick glance at Loranth confirmed that she had been warned as well. Both hands were hovering near the twin DL-44s holstered on each hip. Jax looked warily about, but saw nothing amiss. A few other species, mostly Nyctos, walked or rode the sidewalks as well, 
but it made perfect sense that he and his cronies wouldn't be the only ones to risk a fine by making use of the construction access way. Den said, Now what? in a tone of voice usually only heard from Hanemthi grooms on their wedding nights. Hush. It was menacing, that much was certain. But where was its source? The relative quiet of the access way was suddenly shattered by a loud, throbbing, fluttering noise. Then an ornithopter rose nearby, its wings thrashing the air. At the same time, Loranth shouted, Look out! and shoved him to one side. Jax barely avoided being hit by a slashing emerald blade. Loranth didn't. 29. Jax landed on his side, rolled, and came to his feet in a single smooth motion, letting the Force do most of the work. At some point during the move, he activated the lightsaber, though he couldn't have said when. The blade, crimson, a remote part of his mind noted, boiled out to its full length in a heartbeat. Then he was on his feet and facing Aura Singh. Though he'd never met her before, her appearance left him with no doubt of her identity. He would have little time for doubt in any case because her blade was already whistling toward him. It was a green lightsaber, and its glow painted everything the same shade of corroded brass. Everything, that is, except the Twi'leks' green skin. That it rendered the deep gray-green of ripe chee nuts. Jax had just time enough to register that Loranth was either grievously wounded or already dead and that she was directly in the path of the blade's second downward arc, before he lunged in a desperate attempt to block it. He did, but just barely. The clashing blades crackled, the air was rent with ozone, and the two lightsabers rebounded. Singh's blade had been deflected just enough to miss Lorath. It sheared through the suspended floor of the elevated walkway, cutting supports. Jack's back flipped and came down on the still-supported section, his lightsaber ready for another attack. Behind him, his comrades fell into the abyss. No time for even the briefest of reactions, as Singh was leaping at him again. Several meters below, an emergency response tractor field automatically activated by the disintegration of the corridor caught his tumbling companions. They would slow fall, but he didn't have time to watch. He barely had time to breathe. She rained down on him a fury of blows almost as vociferous as the oaths and curses that accompanied them. Fear me, Jedi. I am Aura Singh, Nashta, scourge of your kind. I haunt your darkest dreams. I drink Jedi blood. I nest in their guts. Your nightmares now have a name, Hierophant, and that name is Aura Singh. He felt the force flowing around her. There was considerable might to it, but it was wild and undisciplined, and as such, difficult to anticipate. He'd never before felt anything quite like it and he'd certainly never heard anything like it. At last, she paused for a moment in her tirade. Raising his lightsaber, he slid his right leg back and lifted the humming beam over his head. You'd be the bounty hunter, then, he said. Hefting her own weapon, the woman grinned a feral grin at him. Externally, she was beautiful. Even without an endocrine advantage, she could give Deja a run for her credits. What Jax sensed within her, however, utterly obliterated any outward impression. She had an ugly soul. You handle a lightsaber well, pray. Suddenly she leaned forward, and her crimson eyes narrowed. Then rage filled them. Or at least, he thought, topped off the last little bit of sanity. It's not like there was a whole lot to begin with. And she snarled. Where did you get that? She indicated his lightsaber. He told her the truth. An acquaintance sent it to me. He shrugged. I guess he didn't want it anymore. She came in, and she was incredibly fast, faster than anyone he had ever encountered. Only the Force allowed him to anticipate her reactions, otherwise he would have surely lost limbs in the first minute of action. It was all he could do to parry the hurricane of blows she threw at him. Cut, 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 thrust, diagonal, cut. He leapt backward to escape, felt the heat of her lightsaber singe his right foot as it cut through his boot and sliced off part of the heel. Maybe needling her into losing control wasn't such a good plan after all. As he flew backward, Jax slashed behind himself with his weapon. 
A newly installed transparasteel pane shattered under the impact of his lightsaber, just in time for him to sail through unharmed. He landed on his feet on the roof. In an instant, Sing followed. She flew through the opening, eyes narrowed, her arms held wide for balance. Her lightsaber was a viridian shaft in the semi-darkness. She cut downward hard, so fast. Without the force, he would have been bisected. Instead, before he could think, his body moved on its own, wrapped in lines of power. Unbidden, his hand snapped up to block her blade with his. Scarlet and emerald lightning once again blinded them both momentarily. Coupled with the force of her descent, her strike knocked him backward again, across the roof construction. He nearly fell off the far edge. Behind him, several massive automata were hard at the business of demolition and construction. At a comfortable control station somewhere, a supervisory sentient was probably kicked back in a form chair, watching as the gigantic machines did all the work. Would he or she glance at a screen, take notice of the fight amid all the heavy work, set down the inevitable cup of calf and notify security? Would the fight even last long enough for help to arrive? She came at him again. She was fast, strong, and good. But she was also reckless. She had said it herself. Her passion lay in hunting Jedi, not fighting them. She was used to striking hard and fast, a streak of scarlet in the night. She wasn't used to fighting skilled opponents for any length of time. Jax kept backing away, parrying, letting the Force completely control him. A wrong move and he would be chopped down. His best bet was to wait, to let her wear herself out before trying to take her down. Assuming he could outlast her, she was humanoid, but not human. There might be different rules for her kind. He was already certain that her fast twitch muscle percentage was far higher than his. He was getting tired, and she seemed as fast and strong as when they'd started. They were among the machines now heavy lifters and composite depositors, link checkers, emitters and synthesizers whirred and hummed and rumbled all around them. Singh continued to push him back, back, always back. Jax went with it. He wanted her to be sure that she was winning. Maybe she was. At least she stopped her diatribe. I was beginning to think she was trying to talk me to death. No need to die she said, as if reading his mind. She threw a fast series of choppy attacks, none designed to do major damage, but rather to set him up for the killing stroke. Really? What do you think your boss plans to do with me? Buy me lunch? Not my concern, Jedi. Surrender now, and maybe you can negotiate something with him. Don't, and I kill you now. An iffy future is better than none. Don't you agree? She charged in without waiting for an answer, and her attack sequence was too fast for him to follow consciously. The Force answered, its strings manipulating him like a marionette's, but his body wouldn't be able to keep up much longer. He blocked, counterattacked, was parried, and ducked just in time as she tried to take his head off. This was not going well. He needed to do something, and soon, or... Singh was growing impatient. The blasted Jedi refused to capitulate even though the Force was all that was holding him up at this point. She wasn't sure how he'd come upon her lightsaber. Most likely he'd had an encounter of some sort with Typho. The particulars didn't concern her. She was intent on getting it back. And she wasn't too particular about how. If it meant prying it from the cold, dead fingers of his severed hand, she was sure Lord Vader would understand. But she wanted this to be over, and soon. Her stamina would outlast most humanoid sentience, but when it faded, it faded fast. Even acknowledging the possibility of failure was not an option. She would defeat this upstart Jedi. Anything else was unthinkable. Movement out of the corner of his right eye caught Jax's attention. The energy of their lightsabers clashed and sizzled yet again, and he allowed the blow to send him staggering back toward the activity he had sensed. All he had time for was a quick look. He couldn't fight any harder. He had to fight smarter. The machine was a large reposticator, or faber. It chewed up raw material that looked like sand from a hopper, then laid a sheet of translucent plate onto the roof for a hard, weatherproof coating. 
The hopper had a safety field that glowed a pale blue to keep things from falling into the raw materials bin. Wise, because the faber would ingest anything that fell into it and restructure the material into its extrusion. A desperate plan popped into his head. He tried an attack, a basic, simple Form 2 series he had learned early on, not really much of a threat. The moves were designed as defense against an opposing lightsaber. Singh did just that, easily blocking the attacks. She laughed. A defense unworthy of a Padawan? Come on, you can do better than that, can't you? Not really, he said. But all he wanted was a little running room, which the moves had given him. He turned, sprinted three steps, and leapt with every bit of the force he could muster, managing to land on the control bar above the faber, arms windmilling in a charade of seeking balance. Singh would be right behind him, he knew. He wouldn't even have time to turn and face her, and she would use the field, guarding the raw materials bin as a step, before launching into a lunge that would easily unbalance him from his narrow perch. He felt for her, using the force. The flashing red button on the control panel was just next to his damaged boot. Jax waited until he felt Singh land on the field. Then he stepped on the button. The field shut off. Singh screamed as she fell into the churning sand. Her lightsaber cut a swath of molten energy through it, fusing the sand into lumpy green glass, then was snuffed out as she lost her grip on the hilt. Singh looked up at him as she sank beneath the sand. It churned while it was sucked into the machine. The last he saw of her was a splotch of red hair. He turned and started toward a nearby drop tube, realizing that his friends should have reached the ground by now. 30. Jax had two bombshells dropped on him in quick succession soon after he got to the med center. The first was from Deja. She had checked out fine, her med scan showing no after effects from the fall. We Zeltrons are a hardy breed, she said with a grin. She seemed quite a bit more cheerful. So much so, in fact, that Jack asked her what good news she must have received while in care. It's a decision I've made, she replied. I'm staying here on Coruscant instead of returning to Zeltros. I want to be part of the resistance movement. What? For a moment, he wasn't sure he had heard her correctly. You mean after all the work and risk that members of the whiplash took on to ensure your safe passage, that I'm staying? Yes. I regret the trouble I've caused, but I think that if you consider what I have to offer, you'll realize it's the best choice. She ticked off the reasons on her fingers as she spoke. I'm basal humanoid which means that with minimal cosmetic and prophylactic disguises, I can be a human, a Miriolan, or even a Twi'lek. I've got the whole pheromonic telepathic thing going for me, which lets me manipulate a room full of people without their suspecting a thing, and I'm rich and beautiful, which gives me access to some corridors of power. Face it, Jax. Your group needs me. He couldn't argue with that. She was headstrong, willful, accustomed to having her own way, in short, a real handful. And she was right. She could be an asset, no question about it. He hoped Loranth wouldn't mind. As it turned out, he didn't get a chance to ask. She was in a private recovery room, he noted with surprise, unusual for someone with no grid references. He suspected that Deja had worked her money and manipulation abilities already to get the Twi'lek the best possible care. She was conscious when he entered, having just undergone extensive Bacta tank regeneration. Her right arm had been almost completely severed, and the lightsaber had caused a grievous wound in her right side as well, damaging her liver and pancreas. Were it not for the cauterization that the energy blade's intense heat had caused as it did its damage, she would have bled to death before she'd hit the ground. He looked at her face again and was surprised to see her awake and watching him. Her gaze seemed even bleaker than usual. She didn't respond to his greeting. Instead, she said simply, I'm leaving. Leaving? Your group. I've decided that I can accomplish more on my own, without the distractions of attempting to solve mysteries best left to the sector police. 
She raised her good hand to forestall any objections or questions. I'll still be around, Jax. I'm sure our paths will cross, but I think it's best that we go our own ways. Jax, still mentally reeling from the news that Deja had just given him, found himself totally at a loss for words. He stood there, mouth agape like a Padawan who'd just seen his first force demonstration. At last, unable to think of any other course of action, he sent his force lines to her, questing for her feelings, expecting nothing more than the usual impenetrable armor in which she shielded herself. To his shock, he found her wide open. Hesitantly, he pushed farther. She still offered no resistance. She's not exactly welcoming me with open arms either, he thought. Still, he knew it took an enormous amount of courage for the paladin to go as far as she had. Such trust demanded reciprocity. He opened himself, laid bare his inner feelings, his secrets, as best he could. He hadn't had much practice in self-examination and realization either. They were precepts he'd been learning as part of his adult training, before the temple had been shattered. Nevertheless, he now stood as close to naked before the Force as he was capable of. He felt her probe him, felt her mind within his, hesitant at first, but then with greater confidence, and finally with reckless abandon. She was looking for something. He realized what it was, just as he encountered the same emotion in her. She wasn't hiding it, though. Cautiously, tentatively, she was displaying it, like a war-torn pennant atop a battlement. The revelation stunned him. I... I never thought of you that way, he said mentally, letting the Force convey the essence of the message without unnecessary words. Nor I you. But things change. She looked at him, and even though the tone of her thoughts was cool and controlled, the sense he received through the Force was anything but. It had all the truth and intensity of her passion for freedom and justice. And even as he felt its heat, he could feel it starting to wane, could feel its fires being brought under control. Wait, he said. But it was too late. Her defenses had slammed back into place, that heavy mental armor, designed to contain the emotional equivalent of a thermal detonator, was aligned and seamless once more. She looked away from him. As I said, she told him, I'll be around. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm tired. Her head lowered to the pillow as her eyes closed. Jax left the room and wandered for a while, trying to cope with the change in personnel. He felt like a fool. But how was he to have known? His life inside the temple had afforded him little opportunity to investigate the fairer sex, and while his life outside had offered opportunities aplenty, the class of beings he now ran with either weren't interested or used sex the same way they used everything else, as a bargaining chip or a weapon. He'd looked upon Loranth Tarek as a comrade in arms, but not in every possible sense of the phrase. Jax abruptly understood the Twi'lek's increasing moodiness and antipathy toward Deja Duare. There was no way she could compete with the other woman, even without her extensive psychochemical arsenal, the Zeltron was a formidable opponent. She had money, beauty, and a fashion sense that made the top clothiers on the planet lick their chops like starving Nexus. Compared with Deja, Loranth was outclassed on every level. All she could do was fight. All she had to offer was a heroic heart. All she gave was... everything. Something troubling you, Jax? I-5's voice broke into his thoughts. He means, Den's voice piped in, that you look spacier than usual. Jax blinked. He was down in the waiting area, which at the moment was giving half a dozen or so humans and humanoids places to wait, either for treatment or for news of others in worse shape than they. Den had gotten off with merely a long gash on his right ear, and the droid had sustained no damage at all. Jax said, I just saw Deja and Loranth. They. We heard the startling news from Deja, I-5 said. How is Laurent? Alive and getting well, said Jax. 
that's the good news, as he continued to tell them of Laurent's decision. A realization struck him with such force that he stopped mid-sentence and laughed. Something funny that we're missing? Den wanted to know. You might say that, Jack said. He composed himself, then said in sonorous tones, Prioritize discreet vigilance and end fugitive recovery operation. That sounds familiar, Den mused. Hey, wait a minute, that's the last thing the Cephalon told us. Exactly, Jack said. He shook his head. It was trying to warn us about the bounty hunter, about Ara Singh. We just figured it out a little after the fact. He laughed again. I thought this was supposed to be a grim and chairless job, said a feminine voice from behind them. They turned as one to see Deja Duare descending a nearby lift tube. She landed and walked toward them. She was wearing a dress that had something in common with the cloud dress of last night, only this one was in more of a liquid state. It was blue, and little wavelets began at her right shoulder and rippled across its length to stop at her left hip and immediately begin again. Instead, Deja continued, I hear laughter, I see smiles. I must admit that as a Zeltron, this gladdens me. She stopped near the Jedi and smiled. Nice dress, he said. It's part of a set. Wait till you see the final one. It's made of fire. He grinned. He wasn't sure if her pheromones were working on him right now and didn't really care. All he knew or cared to know was that he felt great. True, there were still problems to solve. There was the ongoing mystery of Vader's pursuit of him, and what actions he would take to avenge the murder of his father by the Sith. Also, he had not forgotten that realization, born through the Force, that Anakin Skywalker was still alive. If so, it meant that he would have to find the young Jedi someday and return to him the Pyronium Nugget. And he had to decide what action to take regarding the Bota distillate, all these decisions would have to be made in time. For now, however, it was enough to listen to Deja's laughter, see her smile, and feel her touch. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Den shake his head and mutter something that sounded like Ceylon. I-5 nodded in agreement. He felt a momentary flare of annoyance before he realized that they didn't understand. Attitude was everything in this. It was what got you up in the morning, got you through the day alive. He'd much rather have someone like Deja at his side than a grim and contained Laurent. Someday they'd see that. Until then. Let's go, he said. Renan's there by himself. We'd better make sure he hasn't auctioned off everything on the net by now. It was the droid. Renan realized. The droid was the key somehow. It alone had been present at all the events. It linked them all together. The mysterious pursuit and slaughter on Coruscant, twenty years ago. The events on the planet Drongar, with the Jedi Barriss Offi. And the recovery of the data concerning the mysterious Bota. The droid was the connection. He knew it, could feel it. Hananum Tik Renan leaned back in his chair and smiled. It was a formidable puzzle, with some pieces more than two decades old and scattered halfway across the galaxy, and many of those pieces were hidden in places that were not only hard to find, but dangerous to access as well. It was worth it, however, if even a fraction of what he was beginning to put together was true. It would be worth every effort and expenditure, with the power it promised. He could reclaim his former glory, and more. He could challenge the Emperor himself. A challenging puzzle, without a doubt. But the Ellomen were good at putting together puzzles. Very good indeed. End of Star Wars Coruscan Nights, Volume 2 Streets of Shadows Part 2 of 2 Restored and remastered by The Archivist Publishing.